Welcome. My name is Dave Stevens. I'm chair of the Northampton Special Act Charter Drafting Committee. Tonight is the first of two forums where we hope to gather input from the public about Northampton City Charter. I'd like to take this minute to introduce our members of the committee. Let's start over here. And what ward do you represent? Uh, my name is Bill Scher. I represent Ward 4. Mark Warner from Ward 5. Richard Green, Ward 7. Megan Murphy wolf and, uh, at large. And Gail Perlin from Ward 1. Todd Thompson, Ward 2. Fallon Weaver Blanchett, Ward 3. And we are fortunate to have Mary Maduro, the City Council Clerk, who will be our staff person for this event. Uh, missing um, from, uh, unfortunately, is Todd Miranda, who is representing Ward 6, and also our consultant, <coughs> Steve McGoldrick, who is the Deputy Director of the Edward Collins Center at the Public Management at University of Massachusetts. We are going to cover five topics tonight that we have publicized. They are behind up on the screen. We prefer you to keep your comments to those five um, areas. On December 6th, we will hold a second forum to cover three additional areas, and we'll show you that agenda in a few minutes, and then anything else that people have. But we're trying to keep this focused, spend about a half hour on each of the topics you see up there tonight, and um, then on December 6th, spend on the topics that have come up since then. I want to turn it over now to uh, Judge Gail Perlman, who is going to give us some opening remarks. Hi, everybody, and we're really glad that, you, that you're here. Um, ready to talk with us about this, this project. The committee's talked a lot about its mission. Uh, sometimes we say that we're trying to write the, the document that's kind of Northampton's constitution. Uh, the last time anyone tried that was about 100 years ago, am I right? So it, whatever we have on paper now lasted us for 100 years. And, and uh, we, we ask ourselves to think about what a charter might look like for the next 100 years writing something for ourselves, our kids, our grandchildren, and even our great grandchildren. And that's a very big order. And preparing myself for this task, I, I started to think about a mistake that I used to make in my own life when I was young and um, beginning to put my feet into the work world and trying to run an office. I remember that I would hire staff or change a policy always with my mind thinking about what just happened that was wrong. What, what am I fixing? Um, what small events in my office life am I trying to fix with a new policy or, or new personnel? And after a while, I realized that that was not a productive way to go about thinking about changes in the office, that I needed to take a big picture look at things and not just be correcting for the small thing that had just occurred. And as we were preparing ourselves to, to do this work with the Charter, uh, I realized that it's really the same with us. That if we, and when I say we, I mean the committee and the entire population of Northampton, if we get stuck on the little thing that made us mad last week or last year, the little um, the, the piece of anger that we hold about something that happened in our government or or something that was done by one of our government <coughs> officials, um, we'll miss the opportunity to look at the big picture. Not that those concerns of last week and last year are not important. They are important, and if you have them, you need to bring them forward at the proper time and the proper place. But we want to encourage everybody, as you're helping us think through these five questions and then the next three, um, to do it from the perspective of the big picture, to take on your shoulders as we're taking on this sense that we are drawing a map for Northampton, for ourselves to be guided by, and then our kids and our grandkids, and maybe even our great-grandchildren, so that all of us in the generations to come can govern this amazing city wisely. So welcome to all of you for being here to, to help us do this. Thank you, Gail. I'd also like to thank Northampton Cable TV, who will be taping this and be able to show it accessible for you folks, and also our friends at North Street Association, who have taped not only tonight's event, but have taped our committee meetings. They are also online at North Street, and you can uh, watch and have, if you have any questions or information. We prepared a PowerPoint that I'm going to race through pretty quickly, um, and then we're going to focus again on the five questions you see behind me. 
Those five questions are relevant because on the podium, there is a sign-in sheet for each of those areas. If you're interested in speaking while I'm doing my PowerPoint, just stand up and sign up to those PowerPoints for those particular areas. There's also some additional handouts over here that were prepared if you'd like to take any of those with you as well. So feel free just to get up and to sign into those areas. Each of the five questions will be moderated by one of the committee members, and they will work off that sign-in sheet for the first people to speak. And then if there's time remaining, we plan to spend a half hour per question. So, uh, and then we're going to move on to the next question. If we are unable to get to you, we ask you to submit your information in writing. We encourage anyone to submit their information in writing, including the people who are watching from home. There is um, uh, the address to send it, but you basically send it to Mary's office, uh, to her, so she can get it in the public record and on the log. Uh, again, if we're up to yep, slide one. We were found in 1654, and we were incorporated in, in 1884. A charter, and I'm just going to read, that defines the structure of a city and town government of a particular community, and which may create local offices, distribute power, duties, responsibilities among local offices, and may establish and define certain procedures to be followed by the town or city government. So again, that's what the charter is. That some people refer to it as the Constitution, but it is the charter. Our charter itself on slide three talks about, um, you can go in and read it. I hope many of you have taken the time to read it. It is a historical document. As you can see, it was adopted by the House of Representatives and the Senate back in um, June 20th of 1883. But take your time to read this, the charter itself. There are two ways the charters get changed. One is the comprehensive change, which you basically, are, what we're trying to do now is a wholesale, take a look at everything, and make all the different necessary changes that people are recommending. There is also an incremental change. Up to slide five, you see that we have two um, comprehensive char charter changes that have been conducted in the last 50 years. One in 1995 failed to get the signatures necessary to put it on the ballot. And in 1973, it was on the ballot, but it failed by 152 margin. This document, again, and all the references to it are posted online. If you go to Northampton Mass, and, and NorthamptonMA.gov, uh, the website of our city, and you scroll down on the right-hand side, you will see a link that will get you to this PowerPoint if you want to go back and research any of this. Um, the incremental changes uh, that we have done, and I, again, I appreciate the folks from the uh, committee that preceded us. Uh, we've done restructuring in the Public Works Department, the City Treasurer's Office, uh, moving out of the Civil Service System, and we, the Executive Secretary of the City Council and the Cons Con Community Preservation Act were all things that we did through incremental change, and that's a different vehicle than what we're trying to do now. We're trying to do comprehensive change. You see the listing of all the different incremental changes that we've done over the last several years. You can research those as well. Moving to slide eight, um, the committee before us was the Charter Review Committee. Now, on our ordinances, um, in the year 2010, uh, it was chaired by Alan Seewald, and they were supposed to take a look at our charter to recommend any specific changes. This is one of our ordinances to say, please take a look at the charter on, a, on a, every 10 year basis, a, every decade basis. That's also part of good government you see in the source below. We appreciate their recommendations. Um, now, uh, Jesse Adams, Colleen Curry, Marianne Labarge, Dave Murphy, Alan, Margaret, uh, Strebel, Strebel, I'm sorry, and Mark Warner. If any of them are here, could you stand just so we can recognize you for your efforts? We appreciate the efforts of those folks which gave light to us to move forward. Um, uh, and again, within comprehensive change, there are several routes to, um, to, uh, to change the comprehensive charter. One is the Home Rule Charter Commission, where we would elect people who would do this. The other is the Home Rule Petition. We are following the Home Rule Petition route. Where, and this is slide 10, Mayor or City Council appoint study committee, mm -hmm. us. Uh, there are unfortunately no requirements for printing or distribution or public hearings. We're not following that. We're going to go ahead and publicize everything that we do and try to keep you fully informed because we do believe in the open government um, ethos that this uh, community has been following. We make the recommendations to back to the City Council. And uh, we have to come up with something by mid-January. We'll talk about the timeline. The City Council then will take a look at this particular uh, document. 
and the mayor need to vote on this, and then it will go to the House and Senate in the Commonwealth up on Beacon Hill. They will have a timeline that they must follow, and if it is approved, it goes to the governor's office and then to the Secretary of State, who needs to put it on the November ballot. It may or may not get on this November's ballot, but if it does, it will be on the November 6th ballot of 2012. That is the goal of the original committee and our committee is to complete this process and get it on the November 6, 2012 ballot so every citizen of the, of the city of Northampton will be able to vote on whether they feel this charter should be impl implemented or not. Um, number, uh, page 11, you see the actual ordinance, uh, order, excuse me, that was um, written and voted on. On page, uh, slide 12, you will see the members of our committee so you can refer to them. And then again, this is the two forms on page um, uh, 13, and then the second form, which will be on December 6, which is on slide 14. And again, we'll be looking at that particular form and the powers of the executive branch, particularly what happens when uh, we have an absence of the mayor, whether it's a short-term absence or the, the mayor has resigned. We're going to be looking at the administrative and organization uh, and financial procedures, and we'll be looking at elections and citizen relief mechanisms such as free petition, initiative petition, referendum, and we call. So again, that's what we will be doing on December 6th. We'll also have time in there, about an hour, for other, because we know that there are other issues that people have had other than the eight we've identified, um, and we ask you to bring them forward at that particular time. Our timeline is on page or slide 15. Um, we need to complete our report by mid-January very fast. We just started in October, mid-October, so we need to move very quickly through this to get a proposal together for the um, City Council. It'll then go by mid-March, and again, the Governor, Secretary of State, and then November 6th. I want to uh, now look at um, Bill and uh, uh, to introduce question one and lead us through the next 30 minutes um, of, on this issue, if we don't need all of that time, then um, we will revert that to the pool of hold as a whole. I won't, I won't grab the floor. We have a sign here. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Um, so, should the city council and school committee structures change? Should there be more or less ward councilors, at large councilors, school committee members, at large school committee members? Uh, so this is a process to ask ourselves if we should retain the current structure or change it. Both bodies draw representatives from the same seven wards, plus two at-large members who are elected citywide. The school committee has a 10th voting member, which is the mayor, whose role we will discuss later. Each of Northampton's wards have two voting precincts of about 2,000 residents each. And under state law, precincts cannot be bigger than 4,000 residents. So those are the parameters that we're under. There are arguable advantages to either increasing or decreasing the number of wards and in turn the number of representatives. If we decrease the number of wards, and if our current high degree of uncontested elections was a matter of supply and demand, we might get more contested races. With fewer representatives, we could save money on compensation, which the city could pocket, or use to increase compensation for the other councillors and school committee, school committee members, which could increase the attractiveness to run for those offices. Uh, fewer representatives and fewer personalities might make it easier for those governmental bodies to reach consensus. However, if we increase the number of awards of representatives, we might make representatives more accessible to the public, which might increase citizen participation. More voices might lead to richer debate, which could produce better policy. It could also decrease workload, as each representative would serve on fewer committees and attend to fewer constituents, and that might also attract more candidates to run for these offices. Or we could also conclude that what we currently have actually is a good balance of all of these criteria and whatever issues we do want to change should not uh, be changed in this particular arena. Uh, so that is a uh, general overview of the question. I'm sure there could be other angles to this question that I have not brought up that you're certainly free to raise. Uh, and the first person to speak on this subject is uh, Council of the March. We're talking about number one, correct? Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, I want to thank um, everybody for being on the drafting committee. And it's a challenge, and it's a lot of work. And I thank you for being on it. I was on the Charter Review Committee, and we worked extremely hard on that. A lot of researching, going over what we could go over that we felt 
that was of importance. Should the City Council School Committee structure change? I don't have a problem with the way the structure is. Should there be more or less ward counselors? I'm happy with the way the setup is with a counselor in each ward and also two counselors at large. But I can't make that decision. I think if it's placed on the ballot, the voters are going to make that decision. My question to the committee is, do you know what is actually involved with counselors and how much they work? It's what a counselor puts in as far as time. And I put in over 40 to 60 <coughs> hours a week on my own time. And I love it, and I love my job. So I can't answer about what the voters are going to think about it, but I think each counselor represents their word the way that they want to do it. Um, I can't talk about the school committee at large or the structure of that. I think the value would be the school committee members coming in and talking about what type of changes should actually be made with the school committee. I'm just interested about city council. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next person on the sign-in sheet is Wendy. Oh, no. no, not <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are two of us here. I'm Wendy Foxman. Um, I was prepared to just go through the whole thing at once, so I'm going to try to reorganize my thinking here. Just for contextual purposes, um, I served on the Best Practices Committee, which I think is why we're here tonight. Uh, this is one of our stronger recommendations. Um, I also was a town councillor in Greenfield. I, I'm a town administrator. I've served in over a dozen communities and do municipal consulting. I was on the Franklin County Charter Commission, deeply involved in this kind of work. And just uh, for disclosure purposes, I'm an associate with the Collins Center, although they have not given me any work yet. So I just thought I would say that working, working with Steve, I'm with Steve. Um, so just on this, um, and I am on your emailing list, and I get all the information you get. I had no idea you were going to organize tonight's meeting this way, but uh, let's see how it goes. <laughs> um, so I've, I've read all your minutes and all your uh, you know, appendices and all of that, and the charts, et cetera. And looking at what other cities and towns do, I think we, our structure is good. I, I think the current setup for our population, uh, for both the school committee, um, I agree with what uh, Councilor Barge said. It would be good to hear from the school committee, um, and hopefully some of them will come in and speak to this issue. But my sense is uh, the number of councilors, uh, board, and at large, and school committee members works well and represents the city well. So that's all I'll say. Uh, next on the list, uh, Jesus. Um, hi, Jesus Leyva, uh, Ward 3. Um, I guess uh, I first want to say, because I'm signed up for more than one of these, that everything that I'm going to speak to is going to be put into two contexts. One is from having participated in the best practices meeting, uh, specifically the public forum and uh, also from my own personal experiences, having participated in different city venues for the last four years. Um, there are two things that seem to come up over and over again um, in terms of what people have wanted to see this or any other similar body address in the city. One is the consolidation of power in um, the city's administration, and two, um, the need for greater um, participatory power from the public at large. Um, so specifically to this particular idea recommendation, I don't think that the number of seats should go down in either. Um, I, I don't think that the reason that there's so many seats is the reason why we don't have people running for office. I think that term limits um, addresses that problem. If you have a, a forced vacancy uh, on a seat, you know, after you know a term expires, then you will have people running for that seat. The reason why people don't run for that seat is, is anybody who has been involved in trying to put together a political campaign to elect someone is because it is very hard to unseat someone who is already sitting in that seat. The fact that they do sit there perpetuates the idea that they should continue to sit there. Um, and so I think that should be taken into consideration when we're thinking about why people do not run. Okay. Uh, 
that exhausts the list on this one topic. Um, I'm all for getting ahead of schedule. Uh, but do others have anything to say on the subject before we move on to the next question? Counselor? It's a joke. I think there should be more council representatives from Ward 3. <laughs> <laughs> And would you identify yourself for us a little bit? I'm sorry, I'm Owen Freeman Daniel, 4 3 Council. <laughs> Anyone else on this on this topic? Back to you, Chair. Okay. We're going to move on then to we saving a little time here. Pardon? Do we have a moment for a follow-up question? If you'd like to do a follow-up question, go for it. Yeah, uh, Councilman Labarge, you mentioned that you spend 40 to 60 hours a week on the job. But if that's the workload of a typical counselor, then that would preclude a lot of other people from saying, I have that kind of time to run, uh, and thus you know, leave out a lot of people who would otherwise be interested and, and would be able to add their voice to the policy considerations in the city. Is that, I see there are a couple of other counselors here too. I'm wondering if you agree that that is the amount of time that this job calls for. And that if it is that much, wouldn't you feel to some extent that maybe that's a little bit too onerous and there might be some benefits to having more counselors to share the responsibilities? No, because I think it's up to a counselor themselves on how many hours they want to put in and how much they want to represent their ward. When you take that position as a city counselor, it's what you want to make out of it. It's what you want to do with it. If they also agree that that is for the workload? If somebody is addressing somebody, who, uh, the audience at home, you got to talk into this microphone, and we won't pick it up. This is what you guys have. Thank you. Is any other city councilor want to address that particular question? Okay. Is there any other people? Sure. Okay, please. Bill, come up to the microphone. Gene, come up to the microphone. Uh, I'm Bill Dwight, and I'm not a city councilor yet. I'm a city councilor elect, but I have served as a councilor. <clears throat> and Councilor Barge is correct. It's there are challenges associated with it. Um, I, I think, on average, when I worked as a ward councilor, I Marianne is the hardest working councilor that ever walked God's green acre. So I don't mm -hmm. use her bar. We when when I served, it was between 20 and 30 hours at times, depending on depending on the issues. But there are a number. If you just attended the subcommittees and the committee meetings, um, that, that constitutes close to 15 to 17, 18 hours there, and then all the other residual work that's associated with that. Um, and, and consequently, it is a challenge for people, for instance, who are working full-time jobs. And as a result, you see a lot of people, such as myself, who, run, who are unemployed uh, or retired, which gives a certain flavor to the council on, on, on one hand and, and and but at the same time I think part of the concern and I think Jesus addressed this in some level is the we are not getting people who we're, we're missing a large segment of the community being in representation or people offer, you know offering themselves to serve in public service so and I'm not sure if the amount of counselors adjust that or term limits or anything of that sort. I don't actually have an answer. I'm just answering the question. And, I, and, I, and I'm not going to speak for all the counselors, but I have a feeling that's pretty much true. That you can, at a bare minimum, it's 15 hours a week. And I don't think there's a counselor here who, who works that bare minimum, and, uh, and historically has. Gene, would you like to add to this? I'm Gene Casey. I'm the Ward 7 counselor. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, I've, uh, I'm going to say I probably spend about 40 hours a week on research. Uh, I've traveled to Boston on several occasions, Department of Revenue, Administration and Finance, the subcommittees that you spend time on, the people that you call to get their input on what the issue is that you're bringing up. Um, it's a labor of love. I mean, I was born here and that's why I do it. Um, and it's, I think, you know, there's a question on here also coming up that I will just touch on about compensation. I don't think any counselor has ever taken this job on for compensation. Um, it barely covers my office supplies. It nowhere near as, you know, covers gasoline. Um, 
So it, it's a tremendous job, and if you, you, you can spend as much time on it as you want, or as little time as you want. And I think you'll find, too, that those that would spend as little time on it as they want, chances are that will set their term limits. Lorraine, please. <laughs> Uh, Maureen Carney, uh, City Council from Ward 1. Um, I guess my comments around this are uh, similar to those that were already made um, in that you make what you will of the, of the job. Um, there's a considerable learning curve for a new councillor that comes in um, that requires a lot of time and effort. But I don't see that unlike time and effort that I've put into a graduate level course or even another course or something that I'm very interested in and want to put some personal time into. So um, that in itself, the time, the effort, is its own reward if one considers it, um, if the benefits that you get in learning so much about working with people, working with city, how government works. So, um, and, then, and then the, um, the nature of the hours changes. Uh, rather than doing so much learning, it's there is more in the servicing. Uh, I guess a great example is just the work we did last weekend in this cleanup effort. Um, that was uh, something some might consider be, uh, out of the scope of normal counselor work, but it gave, for all of us who were um, involved in that, a really good experience in doing charitable work for one's neighbors. So it's hard to really quantify those things, um, officially, it's a salary job, so um, the pay um, isn't necessarily <coughs> commensurate with the amount of time. I don't know that there's a, I don't know that it's appropriate to measure the the hours and the pay. Um, we all know what the job is, and even as Councilor Lavarge said, we do the best that we can for um, for our own wards. Thanks. Jesse? Uh, the job is highly time consuming, but I do believe that the current structure is very appropriate for this community. Um, back there, yes. I just want to add a comment. Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. Um, you know, in terms of Wendy's comment or somebody's comment about consolidation of power, I just want to suggest that when there are active ward committees, that they can help the councillor do a lot of the work that's out there. And it also is a way to get citizens, more citizens, more actively involved in more issues. And Maddie, I know, is very active on the Ward 3 committee. And so somehow this idea that we're trying to uh, to, get, to make the counselors and get more counselors seems like the wrong direction. I think what we need to do is start to, to figuring out how do we disperse the power down to people really in the neighborhoods. Hi, Mimi Rogers. Um, I think that I, I agree that I, I like the structure of how we have our wards set up, and I think that our counselors do a really great job with, you know, w with what they have. I mean, they, they're getting paid a very small amount of money, and they donate a lot of their time. Um, an issue that has come up many times, though, is that oftentimes counselors don't have the time to get the full research on something or the full knowledge, and, and they maybe are learning about an issue not as in depth as maybe they need to. So just to throw another wrench into this, I'm just going to suggest that uh, the mayor has a full staff. I mean, would it hurt to have like an executive assistant for the city council themselves that would just be a person who could maybe find that research report that Jesse Adams is asking for or find a resource that one of Mary Ann Labarge's, you know, residents needs that would sort of be, rather than, you know, paying people more or getting more people on maybe, and that's just another wrench to throw in there. I don't know if it's possible, but it might be useful to our city councilors if they had one person to go to to do some of those daily uh, research or anything that they might need. Just And then that information could be disseminated to all of the councilors or anything like that. But it just seems to me that it takes a lot for them to take to do that research. And oftentimes citizens feel frustrated that they feel their, their councilors, not only their own councilor, but maybe the other councilors aren't as aware of the information that they are. So. Any other comments on this subject? Any other follow-up questions? And a minimum of $15, or, uh, 15 hours a week 
guys are getting paid about six or seven dollars an hour. Just for the record. Um, we are finished now for question one. Any find, find anything else? I'm going to move on to question two and start the clock ticking on those 30 minutes and turn this over to Megan. Great. Question two, I'm just going to read it. Should the mayor, city council, school committee be elected for <coughs> two year or four year terms? Should the mayor, city council, school committee have term limits, i.e. no more than two four year terms? <coughs> so just to <coughs> recap quickly, we have one mayor, two year term, no term limits. We have a city council of um, seven ward members and two at large, two year terms, no term limits. And our school committee is made up of ward representatives and then a four-year term, no term limit, and then two outlines representatives who have a two-year term, no term limit, with stagger elections. Uh, so we have outlined, go to the next slide, some issues with this question, um, just to get the conversation going, and some questions um, that the committee brought up uh, in our meeting. So I'll just outline a couple of the choices that we wanted to talk about. Um, Two-year term versus four-year term, which is more accountable, accountable to the public, makes elected officials more accountable to the public. Um, how do the different length terms affect decision-making um, by elected officials? Um, Two-year terms versus four-year terms, how does that impact the time that a candidate or an elected official spends campaigning versus governing? And how do we attract new candidates and ideas and also maintain continuity and stability? Um, and then we are also talking about term limits in this question. Um, and so things to consider, concentration of executive power or, or depriving choice to voters. And we've got some questions, but happy to move on to your questions, starting with Bill Ames. Uh, Bill Ames, 26 <laughs> Crescent Street. Uh, I served for, I don't know, something like 26 years on the city council, so I don't favor term limits. <laughs> <laughs> because you, you really get a lot of knowledge as you go along. And um, that, that is just very difficult to come by if you only got a very short term and you've, you've got to get off. On this issue of two or four year terms, I'm really, this is the toughest one for me in this whole list. Um, I, I, I guess right now, I, and I've got to, perhaps uh, I'll change this when I hear more arguments, uh, I, I, I think it's okay for the two year term. Now, what I want to, there's, there's one uh, uh, reservation I have here. The amount of money that people are raising for their re-election campaigns, to me, is is awesome, um, and that should not have to be that you've got to raise a tremendous amount of money in order to conduct a campaign. That may be what's scaring people off, and I don't know how we deal with that because we, of course, we know the mother's milk of politics is money. So I, I don't know how we deal with it. Now, if we give a four-year term, it means you have to do it less often. But I, I'm not sure if that that's going to cut down on the amount that a person's going to have to raise. It's, it's really, um, that's what would, would daunt me if I were <laughs> to run again. And I certainly am not. But um, I don't know how we deal with that. And it's... Uh, uh, the fact that money has come down into local politics. When you're raising thousands and thousands, I, I, I think to, to conduct my campaigns, probably it ran to $1,000 or maybe a little bit more. Um, but that's the type of money we were thinking in terms of years ago. Uh, and so I'm concerned about that. But I, I think I would stay with a two-year term. This is my favorite one. <clears throat> I don't agree with term limits at all. And I have to echo with what I just heard our former counselor, um, Bill Ames, talk about. I am very frightful about the four-year terms. You're talking about burnout. 
is that person actually going to last the four years or not? I'm worried about that. And I have to agree about the cost of running campaigns. Right now, it's, and I'm hearing from many residents about what we just saw in the paper of just running campaigns. And people are saying that money is the evil of all, and I agree it. To me, I'm very conservative running campaigns. I do my own mailings by going to doors, whatever, because I don't agree with the cost of running campaigns like what is happening. But I highly agree in the two-year terms, and like I said before, if the voters want you, they'll elect you. If they don't want you, then you will not be elected. So thank you. <coughs> Wendy? <laughs> I just put Wendy F. <laughs> Wendy Mazza was here, so now. Do you have your full name, please? <laughs> May we have your full name, please? I gave it when I spoke before, but I will give it again. Wendy Foxman? Thank you. Hey. Um, so I, I did speak earlier. Okay. So um, I'll just read what I wrote. Uh, let's see. Um, my experience with towns is three year terms work very well, and I think two is too short and four is too long, and people have already talked about why they thought four is too long. And I use the word daunting as well. Four years is daunting for a candidate considering running for counselor or school committee. I don't know the structural difficulties relative to elections, stagger terms, etc., but if those could be worked out, I believe three-year terms for mayor, council, and school committee would be best. Now, I sort of came late to understanding that the school committee had something different going on. So maybe I'll just put that aside and speak to the council and, and the mayor. Um, so, if, but if given the choice between two and four, I prefer four, but would feel even more strongly about term limits. Um, I'm in the very lonely position of supporting term limits. Um, I basically think, um, and with all due respect for the good service you've provided and others have, um, I do think, depending on the terms, if you have a three-year term, three terms, four-year term, four terms, I think 12 years is enough time to serve if you've got a um, four-year term. <coughs> so um, I, I'm, I hadn't planned on discussing the reasons. I think you've outlined some of them here. Uh, maybe I will say something about that. I didn't realize that you would really be uh, discussing term limits. I just thought you were going to be talking about the terms themselves. Um, I just, I, I, it is harder to come on new and, and if you're running against somebody who's been in office for a long time, knows a lot of people. It's just, it's the nature of uh, connections and campaigning and, and raising the money as well and all of that. And I think we are all enriched and I'm a big supporter of people who know me of getting younger and newer people involved <laughs> having served many, many hours in public life for no compensation. <laughs> That I just think it's good to always, uh, I think there's wisdom in, in the older ones who've been around, but I think it's also good to be bringing in new people, and that's part of the reason why I support term limits as well. Thanks. Wendy, I'm sorry. When you say you support four-year term, do you mean for the mayor and the city council? Well, I said I supported three-year term uh, sorry, for both. Between the choice of two to four, but three yes. years, Yes, yes. For both? Yes, you're always running. If you're in a two-year term, you're, you're always running. And, um, but I, I, I just feel three would be uh, the mom and <coughs> approach to things, so. Could I ask a follow-up question? Well, you mentioned three-year terms. Are, are there towns in Massachusetts that do that? Well, all the small towns who have select boards, those are three-year terms. So they would and then run in November during the general election as well? It's all over. It depends. Uh, a lot of them are, most of them are in the spring. Some are before their town meetings, some are after their town meetings. Now, I did notice in the charts that accompanied uh, your materials, there were some city councilors, who, cities that had councils that served for three years. Um, I was on the council in Greenfield. I, I finished out someone's term, and then I think I had a four-year term. But that was three councils ago. They now have a new charter, and I, I believe they have three-year terms now. I think yeah. I read that in the, in the newspaper and in your, in your yeah, notes as well. So I, I think that could be a compromise. But again, it may be structurally difficult in managing, uh, but I leave that to you. I just think it works well. A first year to learn, a second year to do both, and a third year to be the wise one on the board. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
as a, as a well, well, no, the, there's, a, there's a mayor choice and a city council choice as far as and school committee. Um, and there might be different arguments to make for each position. I just wanted to clarify that for folks. Jesus? Hi, uh, Jesus Leva. Um, I'm not going to speak too much to term limits for school committee because I've never attended a school committee meeting and I would feel awkward about speaking about that. Um, I will definitely say um, that I'm very much in favor of term limits for both uh, the mayor and the city council. And I'm going to go the other extreme. And again, this is not, I'm not suggesting this, you know, against any of the city councilors who have been, you know, sitting on the city council for, you know, many, many years. It's, it's not, you know, in disrespect to their service. Um, it's just sort of to address reality. Um, but first, I, I just want to say I think that the mayor, I think that the two-year um, length of service is perfectly fine. I think that it lets, um, it actually facilitates and creates the need for, um, for public elected officials to be continuing the dialogue with constituents. I think that if we made that longer, <coughs> that um, it would be easier for um, elected officials to be more comfortable with only speaking with their immediate circle of um, elected of, of people who who they'd like to talk to, I think that having to continually run means that it facilitates that conversation. That they have to keep on going back to the people for um, for input and advice and ideas and different ideas. Um, I think that the mayor should serve for no more than four years, two terms. Uh, city council no more than six years three terms. Um, and I, I guess I want to say also that part of the reason why I feel very strongly about that isn't simply, is also because even if you have a really good sitting city councilor, they have their constituency. They have a group of people that they're used to talking. Having term limits means that a different person will be taking their place and they will be looking at things differently. And as you know, communities change constantly. We, I, I think that it's, it's not a good thing to have the same people sitting in the same office when, you know, our entire world changes around us constantly. I'm going to be brief. I liked Wendy's idea of three-year terms, but since we're not considering that, I will go for the four-year term. And I think in part, um, I think particularly for the mayor, that the learning curve is really steep. And I see that Mayor Ford is here. Mayor Ford was here. She's right behind <laughs> you. She's right behind you. Yeah, right by the door. Oh, uh, Mary, I wanted to give you an opportunity since you didn't get a chance to sign in. But uh, I think Ma Mayor Ford can talk to the learning curve that it it takes to become mayor and how how long it took her to get into stride and how good a job she did in her eight years. So I would like to support the four-year term. I also like the idea of, I think we were all a little discouraged in the last mayoral race that so, you know, we had such a low turnout, 48 percent. We get much bigger turnouts when we combine our races with the presidential race. Perhaps this is a way to get more people to vote. And that was one of my ideas about supporting a four-year term. And I'm not going to speak to term limits, just the time of the term. Thank you. Claudia um, So I served three terms as the uh, school committee at large. <laughs> You're nodding your head. So I'm going to speak to the school committee issue, specifically what always seemed odd to me was that this person at large had to run every two years and um, had to cover the whole city to be elected and the wards got to serve for three years I think or four years and they only had you know so they had didn't have to run and they only had to run a small campaign in their ward so 
at, in the least, I think this should be somewhat reversed or else just, um, I'm not sure exactly why this was put into effect. Maybe others know how, why it was staggered. I also want to support term limits, and I really like Wendy's idea of the three years. I agree that, that four years seems like a long time. Two years is way short in terms of like it seemed like I was just always getting geared up to run another campaign. And I like what Jesus is saying. You know, you develop a constituency and you and and those people are very involved. And if you keep on and on and on, then those people become the ones who are essentially making a lot of the decisions in the city, whether it's the school committee or the um, or the um, city council. <coughs> so I, I'm definitely in favor of term limits. And I also just want to speak to public financing, and I don't know whether this is the place to talk to it, whether it's going to go in the charter, but this question of money is definitely a deterrent for people. The idea, it takes a lot of time to raise money, then you have to get people who have money to contribute, and I think we should seriously look to public financing. Um, so, and, and just keeping track of my points here, to go back to the term limits, I think it goes in, it, it <coughs> coordinates with what I said earlier. On some level, yes, it's great to have somebody in the city who's served in nothing. I know Mary Ann is here, and Mary Ford, and Bill, and all these people, and Alex, who served many, many years. But the truth is, if you leave office, we still need you in the city. I think we don't want to consolidate all that information and experience in one person. I think we want to become a city of active citizens. And in order to do that, I think we need to spread this all around a little bit more. Hi, Mimi Adgers. Um, so I am going to start with mayor. I am in favor of term limits. I'm in favor of term limits for all the offices. I think it's a natural thing that we should just, you have to open it up. I'd just like to point out that for our city councilors who, again, and this is not to disparage any of them, as I've said before, I appreciate the fact that they do the service that they do. Um, but in our last election, um, I think Ward 2 was really the only contested race. I'm not going to knock Ward 3 because he just, got, he just ran an election to get there. But, you know, you have people who are incumbents that be, keep running in year after year. And on the one hand, it makes those of us in those wards become a little lazy because we might say, well, we have a great counselor, you know. And so somebody who might have a great idea might not decide to run because they see that that counselor is very popular. Um, and then there's also the money issue. And I just think, though, that if you have a natural timeline and you say, and so, for example, for a city councilor, if they serve two-year terms, I, I don't think that any city councilor should have to serve over 10 years. I think that's an adequate time. They can always try and run for at-large, and to me, that would be a separate thing. So if they're a Ward 2 counselor and they became at-large, that would be a separate office from their ward, uh, from their ward office. And I think that for the mayor, um, I like Wendy's idea also for the three years. I, I, I hope that's something you might think about. But um, because I do agree four years is a long time. I understand the ap aspect of that three years is, two years is too short and there's always campaigning. Um, but I also believe in term limits for the mayor. And one of the main reasons for that is because the mayor's office is a very powerful position in the sense that they appoint a lot of people who do service throughout the city. And a mayor who's served a long time has sort of put in place people within the city who make a lot of important decisions that they're sort of entrenched. And it's, I just think it's a way of, there's a lot of people that have, I just feel like a, a new fresh voice, a new fresh perspective of looking at things, maybe getting new people to serve on different boards. You know, people have been serving on the same boards for as long as a mayor was in office. You know, it's, it's just like you get the same kind of answers constantly, the same kind of responses from your public service people. And it just, you need a fresh perspective. I mean, I, I served on a committee last year and I was surprised at a public forum where I, one of the comments was, oh, the people come and they just say the same stuff over and over. That's somebody who needs to step back and maybe not serve anymore because they're a little burnt out. You know, my perspective was I want to hear what everyone has to say. And so that's a reason to have term limits. Um, as for the school committee, again, I agree with the woman who said the two-year for at-large and four-year for the sitting people is wrong. I think that there should be term limits for school committee again. We want to try and reach out get more people into the process. If there's a vacancy, people are going to say, hey, I could do that job. But if there's not a vacancy, they move on. Some people don't want like to run against someone else. There's a lot of reasons why, so I'm very much in favor of term limits. And I think I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Barry? Uh, 
Gary Hirsch, uh, Massasoit Street. Uh, I agree with everything she said. I thought it was wonderful. I agree with term limits for the same reasons to open up positions. I think one addition is it's a possibility we could say consecutive terms so that someone could take a break for three or four years yep. and would have the opportunity to come back and serve again. Yes. So just another alternative. Deb? I'm Deb Jacobs, 82 Grove Ave Leeds. I, um, I, I'm another three-year kind of gal, and um, <laughs> I, for all the, all the same reasons, I'm, I'm not in favor of term limits. I, I think that the voters um, can make that choice. I think that to just assume that if we have openings, people will run, you've got to have that fire to get out there and run and go out and knock on doors. Um, you know, it's not something that you can just kind of kind of do. You really have to want to. Um, you really have to want to do it. I I don't. Um, I don't know that I think um, limiting the mayor um, just simply because of power is. Um, it's something certainly to think about, but I don't know that term limits do that. I think that becoming a more vibrant city where people um, uh, participate more um, will we'll break some of that. I think we're, we're pretty good, but I think we could be better. Um, I think that for the mayor, um, I think there's a certain amount of uh, budget information that they need to, um, to have, that, that they're the ones who, who present the budget. And I think that, takes, that must take a certain amount of time to understand and learn. Um, and that's one, one more thing to, to, to think about. Um, school board, the school committee, um, I, think, I think the same way for city council as I do for the school board. I, I think that it does make sense in terms of the at-large counselors for them to have a longer term, either the same as um, the regular school committee or not. And I'd also like to thank you all for all the work you did. Thanks. And Alan Seawald. <coughs> I'm Alan Seawald, 60 Ravel Avenue. Uh, just a couple of things. I, I was the chair of the, the review committee, the 10-year review committee, and I want to thank the city council for actually going forward and appointing this committee and charging it because I think this is very important. Um, I don't believe in term limits. Well, I do believe in term limits. They're called elections. Uh, that is what is a term limit. And um, I believe that we need long-term counselors because this is, as we've heard, a very, very complicated job. And I would not like to see this city run on its city council by um, rookies, by a, a large number of rookies at the same time. We need Mary Ann's experience. We need the kind of experience that Bill Ames brought to this job. And so I, I vehemently oppose term limits. I think that the mayor is the executive office, officer of this city uh, uh, should have longer term, should be a four-year term. Um, the mayor is the functional leader of this city, whether people are concerned about the consolidation of power in the mayor or not. The fact of the matter is the mayor is the leader of the city, political and executive leader of the city. Um, I believe that... Uh, the city councilors, um, as a body, um, uh, are a co-equal branch, but each councilor does not have the same position in the city as the mayor does. I don't believe the councilors should have longer terms, and if any of the councilors are going to have longer terms, it should be councilors at large, for the reasons that Claudia mentioned as to the school committee, um, because they are running citywide campaigns, and so... Uh, and they, um, they have citywide issues, not ward issues. Um, so I believe councillors, ward councillors, two years. The one reservation I have is that uh, the councillor elections on midterm, when the mayor is not running, 48 is going to look really good um, those years. That is my concern. And so that um, a, a ward council candidate 
um, a marginal ward council candidate who sparks interest in a small number of people can get elected, and I don't think that's a good thing. But all in all, on balance, I think ward council is two years, uh, and mayor four years. And um, if there's a, uh, a perception of consolidation of power in the mayor, let's get the mayor um, uh, away from presiding over the city council, and that will reduce that perception. Bill, Maureen, Mary, and Jean, in that order. Owen, oh, after that. And I'm watching the clock. It's my got job, it. and we got to move fast. Uh, I've been in five competitive races, actually. Actually, four competitive races. I've ran five times, and only once I ran unopposed. And I'm, I'm actually also opposed to term limits because we do have a mechanism and it is an election and it's not to be facetious, but the fact is beyond that, if we why not eliminate elections if they're failing us? If we want, if we want more and more people to serve who are, who are more reluctant because of whatever is associated with running, then do a lottery. Do it as community service. Sentence people to. <laughs> <laughs> and the, it, the, the, as to term limits, I, I, I think that, I mean, I, I actually, I'm adverse to it in so many levels, principally because we invest in a democracy and it can be subverted by all the mechanisms that everyone's described. If you look at the council historically, from when Bill Ames retired, there's been an enormous change. The council's changed, and you go from people who've been senior who sit there for a long time, and then people who turn over for a variety of reasons. I left after eight years feeling that I had served long enough, and I, and I, didn't, ask the, I didn't ask my constituents, but I did leave, and now I've come back the same thing. The fact that there are people who are relatively new, you have Owen Freeman Daniels mixed with Marianne Labarge, and you, have, you get a spectrum of experience that is enormously helpful. Same for the mayor. I mean, the thing is, and, and I, 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 think, I don't think a term limit for a mayor should exist either. And in fact, actually, Mary Ford, Claire Higgins, Dave Sandy, all experienced strong competitive races that brought all the issues forward that people were discussing and, and were concerned about. And the fact is that they won. Now, there's some people who were upset with those facts, but that that's the nature of an election. That's how those things shake out. And as Alan suggested, if you have a problem with the consolidation of power, don't go after the person because, as Judge Perlman said, you go after the position. You analyze the position, you analyze the circumstance. Now, let's, we, and my concern is that a lot of this, the impetus for this discussion is based on recent politics, not holistic politics and the way the city is structured. School committee, <laughs> the school committee, for, uh, it's not a rare time when we come up short, coming close to deadline, and some and there's a space open. It's a short straw job. It's a, it's it, it requires a great deal of people to get up and go invest themselves in something that strong, that passionate, uh, where the issues are much more intense because you're talking about people's children. So I, I you know, I, I think that whatever we can do to encourage people to run and not discourage them to run would be best. I'll leave it at that. Maureen, come on up. I'm going to borrow a little bit of time from the question one, which we finished early, because there are relevant people who need to speak. Please. Uh, then I will be quick. Um, I uh, echo what some of the previous spokers, um, speakers said about uh, term limits, um, that elections do solve that. While I understand that incumbency has its advantages, at the same time, those who are in the office and serving do need to run a campaign while they're serving. So um, I, I see kind of a balance in that. Um, the one uh, uh, counselor from Ward 5, uh, Dave Murphy, could not be here tonight, and I, we were deciding who would go to the traffic calming meeting. He, he got that meeting, and I got here, but, uh, and we disagree on this topic. Um, he did suggest that uh, he he believes that, um, or actually we're on the same line, four-year terms would not be a good uh, <coughs> fit for Northampton, especially for, for ward councillors, because folks uh, typically don't realize how much work is involved until they get into the seat. And um, it would be a, a hardship for the city to be left 
with a counselor after one year who felt they could not do the job, and then have to have a special election on that. So I think those are all the points I made. Um, not in favor of term limits. Elections can solve that. And uh, two-year limits, at least for ward counselors, should stay the same. A four, I think, would be okay for at-large and for mayor. Mary Ford? Um, first, I want to apologize for coming late. Um, I had to report for a shift of work at 6, which was canceled. Came home and turned on the TV, and these TV cameras are not live. So I assume that um, this will be showed later, but uh, I came down because it wasn't live. Um, just a few things. The, the two-year term for uh, legislators, the, the school committee and the council, <clears throat> um, is the same as the United States uh, representatives in Congress in the lower house. And one might keep that in mind. The idea of the two-year term, as opposed to the six years in the US Senate, is that that body is closer to the people. Running every two years makes people keep their ears to the ground with their constituents. <coughs> that, that was the theory. Um, I personally was <coughs> going to suggest you look at a three-year term. The reason we typically had two or four years is because we, um, wanted to coincide with state and federal elections because we ran in parties 30 years ago. We don't run in parties anymore. So you don't have to be on that schedule. You do have to figure out how you can hold your elections without adding a lot of money. Um, I wanted to put in a, just a word for the school committee. I think you should have a whole separate forum with current school committee people and uh, the parent leaders who come to most of the meetings and the staff and so on for the reason that school committee members do work really long hours and um, the mayor currently is a voting member of that body just uh, reading all the material not even sitting on their subcommittees their budget subcommittee physical plant curriculum and so on um, I found it added hours to my schedule, and um, I often said to myself, gee, their compensation should be closer to the city councilors. I don't know what to say about terms. I've never understood the division of their terms, except again, I think there's a historical reason. School committee used to set a tax rate applicable to all the properties in town. It was only with the advent of Prop 2 and a half that was taken away. The school committee's official powers now have really come down to appointing the superintendent, supervising the superintendent's work, translating the needs of the community, and um, uh, approving the budget for the school committee. But I think when the school committee used to have such a strong financial impact on all the voters is why they had a weird system of terms. And people ran for school committee precisely to hold down spending um, in the olden days. So maybe some of, some of that would help. Um, I, I think three years is a nice time. Uh, it goes without saying, probably, that I don't, I don't believe in term limits. I believe in the public being active. And people who are not full-time in a municipal position <coughs> are supposed to be, in my interpretation, primarily volunteers. So they need a decent compensation. The city council's compensation hasn't been raised in, in I think, 25 years. However, um, it, it's not a job one does for money. It's, it's a citizen job. You're representing the citizenry when you're serving on either school committee or city council. That's important, in my view, to keep that in mind and then use that to shape issues like longevity. And if I could just add quickly two more little things. Your third question... Oh, no, I've got to hold you on that because I'm watching the clock. I know, but you... <laughs> just, Come back to the third you, you don't want me time. back. That is not a charter question. Please understand, you should be looking at a mechanism to propose and approve compensation. You shouldn't be having a discussion about we'll the compensation on levels, okay? Okay, um, Gene, um, I saw you and Owen, and then we're going to have to wrap this up because we're walking into borrowed time.
be very quick. Uh, I'm, not, I'm opposed to the term limits because even the new councils, they do get to, they get to draw on the experience of the councils that they're going to sit with. So, uh, such as I'm on the finance committee and things such, and I had a pretty good idea that I had a pretty good handle on the budget to start with. And then as I sat along, I remember financial transfers, every one that we've had, you know, I can remember. So it, it, it's something, the experience it is valuable um, to all the councils, for councils that have sat for a long time. And remember what Morris said, he just got elected in Holyoke. He said, when they asked him how he thought he got elected, he says, it's because I haven't been around long enough to owe anybody anything. Owen, wrap us up, and then if anyone else has input they'd like on this, again, we have a handout. You can send it in for to be part of the record. Thank you. Owen Freeman Daniels, uh, <coughs> Woodmont Road, uh, also City Councilor. Um, I think that um, if given the choice between two years and four years for any elected office, I would say two. But... Um, the three-year option, I think, is actually preferable in many ways. Uh, I think that you would have, there's an unintended um, outcome that every six years you'd have a, probably a much larger voter turnout because it would coincide <coughs> with national elections. I think that's a good thing for the city. It might reallocate the council members, actually, or the mayor uh, significantly. Uh, and it would probably mean more people would pay attention to local politics. Uh, I think three years is good because you aren't always campaigning, but I also understand that uh, you should be, if you're a counselor and if you're a strong mayor, you should always have your ear to popular opinion um, on the local level, so I think four years is too long. But, and I'm also opposed to term limits, however, if you said that four years was the term, uh, then I would think that two uh, mistakes might make Oh, right, and in fact, I would be in favor of term limits if you had four years as the office. Uh, <laughs> There's a point of information we're going to need to clarify on this particular issue with three years. I do not believe that you can hold local elections on a federal uh, election day. Um, I believe that that is not possible. So we will clarify that, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can't pursue three-year terms like Greenfield has, but they hold their elections in May. So it's just a different way of doing things that we could take a look at as part of this process. But we cannot necessarily hold a local election the same day as we're holding a presidential election. That is not a believe allowed. I'm looking for a city clerk on that, but I do not believe that is allowed. I don't think so either. Okay. Um, if that's all for question two, we're going to move into question three. Todd. You heard what the mayor said. Mike. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and comment. Um, I've been asked to sort of frame the discussion around compensation of elected officials, and the mayor is correct in a way. We this was suggested by um, the consultant who's helping us, Steve, um, who made the observation that elected officials um, don't like to give themselves raises. And as um, the mayor hinted, it's been probably 20 odd years since the council salary has been adjusted. And he said that the charter review process and the drafting process was an opportunity um, to look at current practices and see if they need to be adjusted. So that's why we're, we're looking at it in this forum. Um, but the mayor is correct. Um, whatever suggestions come out of, of this process um, will not tie the hands of the council moving forward. It's their authority uh, to set salaries and compensation um, in general. And um, what we're doing won't, won't stop that. Um, so let me go ahead and just race through this slide because I'm sure there are going to be some comments. Um, the mayor of Northampton is the full chief executive of the city. Um, that's a full-time position with an $80,000 salary plus benefits. Um, that salary went into effect in 2007, and $80,000 falls as sort of the low end of the range for comparable cities um, in this area. Holyoke, Chicopee, and West Springfield pay their mayors $85,000, Pittsfield $86,000, and Westfield, um, 90,000. Um, the city council, uh, councilors receive a $5,000 salary. Um, the president receives an extra $500. Um, compensation also includes health insurance, um, which I sort of value ballpark at around $5,000 for individual policy, $12,000 for a family. Uh, currently, five of the nine councilors take health insurance, three individual policies, and two family policies. Cost of the city um, for health insurance is $38,000 for the city councilors. 
Um, school committee members receive a $2,500 stipend uh, plus benefits as well. Currently, two members of the school committee are taking full health insurance. Um, total cost to the city, just under $17,000. Um, this brings us to the questions. Uh, first one is, should the mayor's salary be increased? Um, I'm going to run through some pros and cons, um, uh, just to, to throw, throw some arguments out for increasing the mayor's salary. Um, a higher salary might attract more qualified candidates to the job. Um, the current mayor's salary is less than the police chief, who earns $114,000, the fire chief, who earns $113,000, and the school superintendent who earns $128,000. Um, the mayor is also prohibited under the charter from holding another job. So um, this is a full-time job and he, uh, he or she can't work elsewhere. Arguments against raising the mayor's salary, uh, um, fairly straightforward. The city is strapped for resources. Giving a, mayor, a raise to the mayor would mean fewer resources for other departments uh, in the city. And that uh, in this economic environment, it's not appropriate uh, for the mayor to be, to be receiving a raise. Um, second question, uh, should the counselor and school committee members' stipends be raised? Uh, arguments for increasing pay for council members, uh, the current pay of $5,000 uh, for a 15-hour week um, uh, is, is, is paltry. Um, uh, a high pay might attract candidates from a broader socioeconomic spectrum. Um, not just those with, uh, with major outside sources of income. Um, increasing the salary might allow members to devote more time to the job. And uh, Stephen, the consultant, also indicated that comparable pay uh, for part-time counselors in this part of Massachusetts is around uh, $10,000. Um, arguments against raising pay for counselors. Um, as I think Mary Ford had commented, uh, public service should be its own reward. Uh, we don't want people right running for office just for the money. Um, it's also a part-time job, and we have to ask the question, what's the appropriate salary um, for, uh, for uh, part-time public service? Um, another issue is that some may raise is some counselors are receiving two to three times the value of their salary in health insurance. So if you look at the total compensation, how, how, how do you weigh that? Um, and the same arguments about economic conditions um, that I mentioned uh, for the mayor's uh, salary would apply to council members as well. Um, the same arguments also apply for school committee members. Um, again, the question, what is the appropriate salary for the amount of work that they're doing? Um, according to Stephen, um, some cities don't pay their school board members at all. Um, others pay them $5,000. We're right in the middle um, at 2500 but that's a, certainly an issue we'd like some feedback on. The final question, um, should part-time counselors and school committee members receive employee benefits? Arguments in favor um, are that without this benefit, some candidates would not run for office. Um, others say that it wouldn't be fair to take this away from current office holders. Um, arguments opposed, um, there's the question of equity and fairness. Uh, some council and members who take health benefits are getting twice or three times the compensation of their colleagues. Um, there's also a matter of transparency and the importance that compensation for elected <coughs> officials be fully disclosed and an issue that they vote on, not something that they receive as a benefit. Um, and there's also the issue of best practices. Um, a conflict of interest arises when public officials are potentially cor corrupted by their personal interest, when counselors and school committee members are approving contracts and benefit packages for city employees, mm -hmm. They currently have a clear private interest in the outcome. Uh, they stand to benefit directly um, and personally from the benefits they grant city employees. Stephen indicated that some communities in Massachusetts um, prohibit benefits uh, to part-time elected officials. And um, that's all I have. And I'll open up the, uh, the floor for comments. Um, Jean Casey. Like I said before, it's a labor of love. I, I didn't do this for the money. I don't uh, partake in the city's health insurance program. Um, and if it were up to me, I don't know. I'm happy with the $5,000. It doesn't cover everything, but uh, I never expected it to. That's all I get to say about it. Mary Labarge? I really don't care about the money part of it because I didn't run for the money. I also, the same as Councillor Tacey, 
I don't have any of the benefits, and I don't need the benefits. So the money is not the issue for me as a counselor at $5,000 or whatever. If we don't get paid, then we don't get paid. I'm doing it because it's in my heart, and I like my job. Thank you. Wendy Fox. Um, I, I don't have a strong opinion about the council or the mayor's current compensation. Um, I think 80000 probably is good, though, I will say that, for the, for the mayor. Um, just in the way of transparency, though, I believe that the, the um, you know, there's been a real fluctuation, a change, a tightening up of the pension float programs in the state. And I believe now in order to uh, be entitled to a public pension, an elected official would have to be making at least $5,000. Uh, correct me if I'm you know, people are okay. So um, definitely shouldn't reduce that amount, <laughs> um, but I, I'm not sure that is enough. Um, I, I do believe it is rare for school committees to receive any compensation, and in fact I think regional school committee members, they're prohibited. Uh, small town uh, committee, school committees don't, don't receive any money. Um, so I'd just like you to review and compare this. I'm not suggesting that you take that money away or reduce it, but just review and compare with other comparable communities. Um, I hate to begrudge anybody fair compensation, particularly in this environment of reduced or stagnant pay, lack of jobs, and a, vo a very volatile health insurance scenario. Uh, when we should be moving towards national health insurance, we've got nightmares to deal with everywhere. And I've been in the midst of those in many jobs that I've been in, and policy decisions and health trusts and all of that. But I think especially given our very tight municipal budget, Health insurance should not be available to counselors and school committee members. This is a tremendous expense and not a predictable expense as well. I communicated with Senator Rosenberg about legislation he filed several years ago that would um, have allowed local officials access to the municipality's health insurance with full payment to be made by the local official, kind of like COBRA, you know, when you leave a job and you, you can still t take advantage of it, you have to pay for yourself. I, I didn't hear back from him this time, and he's still in the hospital, I believe, but the staff didn't get back to me. But I believe the legislation didn't go anywhere. Um, and I, there, I think it's a, a sound good option, but um, I don't think it's feasible for Chapter 32B, which is the statute. It's just very complicated. Um, but if that were feasible, I think that would be a fairer way to do it. Um, I've been asked to run for council for, for several times, and I must admit the health care coverage is a big draw for me. Not to diminish their hard work, but I know it has been a consideration for some council members, perhaps school committee members as well, and others who have previously served. I don't think that's a good, good reason to run for office. Mm -hmm. um, I can't read this up. They? Uh, yeah. My name is Barry Roth. Um, I think uh, the council should be paid uh, a great deal more. I, I, I believe that, that the people who are running are running out of, out of a civic uh, pride, and I think that's a great thing. But at the end of the day, um, you need money to live in this world, and it's not unreasonable to expect to be compensated for your time. I know that uh, Mayor Koch in New York City asked why policemen get paid more than firemen. And he said the reason is because when we advertise for uh, firemen, they're willing to work for less than policemen. It stands to reason. That's, that's the nature of, the demo, uh, of, of a capitalistic system. You put out a salary and you see who comes to apply for the position. When you have so many positions running without someone uh, being challenged for that position, it means that the compensation is inadequate. And while I know that some Councilors do spend a great deal of time researching the jobs and doing the jobs. I know I have a great counselor. At the same time, uh, my observation and my in interaction with the city government has shown that on many issues, the councilors do not do the adequate work. Sorry to say that, but I have seen them, what I believe has been rubber stamping, and I believe, as an example, uh, there were stipends for the uh, fire department assigned of $700,000. Two city councils said they could not be uh, there to discuss it because they had to go on vacation. 
uh, one of the councils was not challenged in this past election, and one of the councils uh, had a late uh, challenger. And I think that that shows that uh, there isn't enough incentive uh, to challenge them. There's a great deal of work involved. They should be paid more. They should be paid a lot more. <laughs> Hi again. Um, I also agree that I feel that the city council city councilors should be paid more. Um, for uh, many different reasons, one of which is the fact that currently uh, an average person couldn't really afford to be the city councilor. I, I, I agree with Marianne Labarge. She puts in a ton of hours. Um, people call you. People need your help. You're serving on committees. You're you know you you're going to forums that you're not even serving on because you want to hear you know represent not only your own views but your citizens' views. It's a lot of time. Average working people different voices, different ages, young people aren't going to, you know, they're going to say $5,000 and maybe not decide that that's something that they're going to take their time for the amount of time that, it's, that you spend on it. The real question comes back to what I think Mary Ford was saying, which is how do you pay for it? How do you make that happen? Um, ultimately, I think that as horrible as it sounds, the voters should have to vote on it. I mean, it's almost like a prop two and a half override, but you have to figure out where you're going to get the money to pay for those extra salaries. I do think, though, that there can be strong arguments made for it, much like there was for the police department, and we're looking at the DPW building. I think that there's a strong reason to do it. Um, I think that uh, the mayor's salary likely should go up. I mean, it should be somewhat measurable with other communities. But, you know, as with anything here, we have to think about how we're paying for it. I mean, we are not, you know, to, to ask people to come up with more money, I mean, we like to talk about it's a cup of coffee. It's just a cup of coffee a day, but Currently, I think I'm spending about ten dollars. I'm buying ten cups of coffee for the city of Northampton every day, so it's you know it gets a little overwhelming. Um, for the school committee members, I got to be honest, I didn't even know that they got paid, but uh, I think that they do a lot of hard work. People don't realize the amount of time that goes into it. One of the reasons why I stand back and just get up and speak because I look at what they do and I know it's a lot of hard work. And I know as a full-time worker with children and everything, there's no way I could dedicate that amount of time while working a full-time job. So. That's why I feel that if it was increased, it would benefit. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Carroll. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm getting over a cold, so. <coughs> My, name <laughs> My name is Steve Harrell, and I live at 474 Elm Street. Uh, I kind of... I know we're doing this in sections, so I'll try to switch around here. Um, the city, first of all, the city council, uh, I think, is very underpaid. Uh, it's it's terrible. Uh, they work so hard. Uh, I've been to enough city council meetings to see them work, and that's just the cream of the crop when they're there. They do all this background work. They talk to their constituents. They have to study plans and programs. It's amazing. And I, I think the salary is almost embarrassing. It's like not um, respectful to them for the work and their energy and their vision and their commitment uh, to the citizens and to our, our great city. So I, I don't know what the figure could be. Uh, it uh, supposedly is a part-time job, but uh, Councillor Labarge says she works 40 to 60 hours a week, and I can see that. Uh, it should be thirty, forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars, $50,000, maybe more. Um, so uh, there is a question. Of, uh, what's that? I changed my mind. Oh, there you go. Well, <laughs> she's changed her mind. No, I mean, I'm going to run now. There you go. I disagree with you, but I'm going to run. <laughs> and following along with that, I myself, in some moments of weakness, have considered running for uh, city council. Uh, but when I consider the, uh, the compensation, I just... I can't do it. Um, I, I also have a job that I love. It's very rewarding to me. Uh, it's great, and, uh, but I, I do get paid for it, or I should say I pay myself for it. But, uh, so uh, the compensation, I think, is, is to be considered, even though uh, you love the job. Um, moving quickly then to the uh, school committee, uh, in the last three or four years, I have been to a large number of the school committee meetings. Uh, 
and stayed till the end of a number of them, right up to 11 o'clock, uh, starting at 7.15. Uh, I'm pursuing a couple of uh, issues that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, not here for that tonight. Um, but also, I've seen how hard they work. And they are, some of them are professional educators. They're, they're, there's a pediatrician uh, on the uh, committee. Um, and this salary is, I don't want to use the word laughable, but that's the one that comes to mind. It's just so unfair. It's ridiculous. Um, they should be paid at least as much as the city councilors and a lot more. Uh, they're very committed, very intelligent. They have a big job. The city, um, their, the school committee budget is $28 million, I think, uh, in that vicinity. It's a big chunk. It's the biggest chunk of the city expenditures. Uh, and they're getting 2500 It's amazing. Um, so um, I, there, there is a question, and uh, I know the time is going, of where this money can come from. And of course, uh, I feel like uh, much more of it should come from the state. Uh, they, we need to have a more graduated income tax at the state level, so more money can come to the cities and towns. There's also a large number of loopholes in the state uh, tax code. Uh, loophole sounds like a small word, but it's really a large amount of money in a number of areas. That all needs to be cleaned up and straightened out. Um, also, I wish we could have a, uh, a, city, uh, a city income tax. Uh, it's, it's out, uh, I think it's impossible in the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but in other areas there is a city income tax uh, I don't, that's probably a long way away, but um, we need more taxes, more income to pay for what we want as citizens. And uh, so the revenue has to be looked at also, but for this uh, topic tonight, I believe the city councils, councilors and the school committee members should be paid a lot more. Thank you. Emily? Hi. Um, I would like, I agree that the city council and probably the school committee uh, should be paid more. Uh, I'd like to point out what you said, Judge, I don't remember your name, Pearl. Judge Perlman said in the beginning about how we have to think about the future, how this will affect our grandchildren and our children. And when you think of something that's really affecting the children and grandchildren now is uh, college and college debt. And that it's not uncommon to leave college with $40,000 in debt or more than that. Um, I know for me, as the youngest person in this room and looking at colleges right now, that thinking about how much debt I'm going to leave with um, and wanting to do something in public service, this is something I certainly would never do at this rate because I just couldn't. And I think that a lot of people that would love to serve their community couldn't be able to do that either. So I think it's something to keep in mind. Last name on the list. Would anyone else like to stand up? More to say here. I mean, call me a dreamer, but I have a different vision of city government. I, I'm against this idea that we would have paid professionals, you know, people who are making $50,000 and doing this <coughs> as a job. I think there's something to be said for people who are in the workforce, who have a, a life outside of the city, uh, being part of city government. It keeps us connected to who are the people out there that we are serving. Um, I was on the school committee. I, I'm not sure who was it was saying how limited the role has become. Maybe it was Mary Ford. But I'll say that I don't think there's anything more important than in the city than people advocating for children because this is the future. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm torn about this idea of pay. There are certain times in people's lives when they have more time. When I was on the school committee, my kids were sort of middle aged. They were like six, seven, eight, nine. You know, I have a husband, he has an income, we were working part time. I was able to do this. I know not everybody is able to do this, but maybe this is an ideal that people say, all right, at this time in my life, I'm going, and this is also connected to my. Um, idea about term limits. I mean, if you get people and you're paying them and they're going to not have to run time and time again, then what are we talking about here? We're, I'm, it's a kind of frightening vision to me. So I'm saying that, you know, people could say, all right, 
I have six years, is what I said. I'm going to work for six years um, for the city on the school committee, and then I'm going to turn it over to somebody else. I could afford to do that. I'm in some privileged position, but so I don't know. I think actually the compensation is just right. It's a little bit. I thought it was great to receive anything, and I don't think I would have done it because there was money involved, and I don't think I would have been dis... Uh, I would have not... I would have chosen not to run if there was no money. I was motivated, and I did it. And I think this is what it's all... For me, this is what I think in the ideal city government should be about. Next, Morgan. Just one quick comment about um, about the health insurance. I would prefer to look at uh, the present scenario that we have as one in which uh, seven of nine counselors decline the um, the health care benefits that they're entitled to, and that's because they either have them through their regular day job or through a spouse for which that they they can have it, and those that do use and I, I don't know who, who does use the health care benefit, use it because they need to. And should any, any one of us during the course of our service lose our job, um, we know that, you know, the law, we, it would be a sad day that we'd have to also step down from the council at that point because we have no access to health care and have to, you know, find some other way. I just think it's a small token. It, it, it's... It goes along with, you know, what we've already discussed as, you know, pretty um, incomparable pay to the amount of work that's involved. So that's my, my take on the health insurance. Deb Jacobs from Leeds. I believe that only the mayor gets a salary and that what the counselors get is a stipend. Um, I don't think it's salary. I, I think Technically, that's... Technically, my understanding is that it is a salary. It's paid out bi-weekly or, or monthly, and Mon you get a paycheck. Monthly, it's so it is, it is no longer yeah. a stipend. Because I think originally it, it was. Thank you. Next. Jeff Massimino, Northampton, and math instructor at Ola Community College. And um, I just want to say maybe something like a compromise something around $10,000 or so, something that's appropriate for a part-time job but gives counselors, you know, like Gene was saying, $5,000, doesn't even come cover its supplies, so a little more gives people maybe more of an incentive to run, but at the same time, I'm not really sure. I think that, combined with the benefits, the health insurance, because as Maureen just mentioned, well, what happens if you lose your job and you don't have your health benefits? <laughs> Does this mean you have to potentially step down from the council and find another job? So I'm not really sure, but I think maybe some kind of a compromise. I think it shouldn't necessarily be about running for the money, but at the same time, I agree with what several people said, that $5,000 for the amount of work, I mean, Marianne's putting in 40, 60 hours a week, that for $5,000, what does that work out to, about three, $2 an hour or something like that? Not the... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> not that you're counting. Good job. Half of living wage. Oh. Yeah, that's kind of... So yeah, it's something to consider. Thank you. Uh, can, can, I'm sorry, can I just, I just feel the need to just address a couple of things. So I, I appreciate what people are saying that to serve the community is wonderful. Um, unfortunately, that's a luxury afforded to people who can afford it. I really love this community. I would love to serve. I think my husband would divorce me. For $5,000 a year, the amount of time that gets spent doing it. Um, and, and the reality is, when you have people of means and retirees who make up the majority of the people who are representing our community, it's not representative of the whole community. I agree that it would be nice if people can take the time to serve, but the reality is we are facing very difficult economic times. Most of the people in this community don't have means. It doesn't mean they don't care. And you know what? It would be wonderful to get the perspective. We don't have people of color serving on our city council. We don't have people, I'm not sure about the school committee because I'll say I'm not as familiar with it, but we have a large population and, and actually at a, at a mayoral debate it, uh, it was brought up. We have a certain percentage of people of color and not many people who serve in government or, or even work for our city. Um, what could we do to draw them in? Uh, you know, $5,000 a year isn't a lot of money. 
I'm, I, I just want to say that while I think that there are great high moral grounds that we can say we should serve and be so proud of that, I think that's true, but the harsh reality is even if it was $10,000 a year, it would be something that would be more comparable to get more people to consider it because we have wonderful people in this community with really wonderful abilities. Wendy Foxman is one of them, but I just think, as the, as the judge said, looking f future down the line, I want to hear what other people have to say. I want a low-income person sitting on our city council who can bring that perspective to every debate that gets brought up. We don't have that perspective. And I'd like to have that person sitting there. I'm a low-income person. I don't have a low-income person representing me. So I just like to make that comment. Thank you. Anyone else? We've got about three minutes. Uh, quickly to that point, actually, um, maybe then a consideration would be a sliding scale based on income. And, um, and, and I realize that requires all the, the candidates to reveal their income, but if there was a sliding scale compensation to, to facilitate people of, who don't have the means to run, don't have the means to serve uh, the part-time as it's called, but I think with a wink and a nod, it is pretty damn close to full time. Because when I worked as a counselor and worked at the video store, I was, I actually, it was a, I lost money because the compensation never panned out to the hourly wages I lost to give up to go to meetings to skip out of work. And which is also informed why I decided to quit about Chile. So, I, I, but I don't even know if there's such a mechanism exists, but it's one worth considering. Hey, Zeus, did you have something? Uh, yeah, I guess I wanted to add that um, I, I guess I sort of echo what Claudia and Wendy are saying. Um, and at the same time, as a low-income person who has thought about the idea of running, and definitely it is a barrier, but I think that the, the thing that frightens me more is the idea that we have that you need to sit in one of the city council seats in order to have a voice in the community. And if that's true, then we need to be having an entirely different conversation. Um, if I felt that I didn't have a voice, that I would need to sit in the city council seat in order to have a voice in the community, then... Um, we're in trouble. <laughs> um, I think the only reason why we consider differences of compensation than what we have already is has to do with one of the next questions, which is about should the school, um, should the mayor chair the school committee and or the city council? And I don't think they should. So if we don't have the mayor chairing the school committee, then you should probably give some additional compensation to the person who is. Um, but I'll speak to that when we get to that. Uh, you have one, you have time for one more speaker. Anyone else? Um, go ahead. John Galston, 24th Avenue. Uh, nobody's yet mentioned the fact that we live in a world where inflation is not only considered normal but healthy for our economy. Therefore, uh, $5,000 is certainly inadequate now, but it becomes in value, what it can buy, more and more inadequate every year. If we wait a couple of decades or so, it won't even be worth the price of writing the check so, to pay it. So I think we really at least need a cost of living adjustment automatically for our council. Okay, I recognize time. I, I saw at least Jean's hand. If Jean would like to submit something in writing, or do you have a quickie? Very quick. Podium, hurry, fast, run. <laughs> it, 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 it would be nice if you had more people on the council that were struggling. And they can better relate to the people out there that are struggling. That being said, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to turn to question four. Question four is going to be run by Maddie. Maddie, take over. Um, I just have to say first that I have a cough, so bear with me. Sorry. Um, currently, um, uh, currently, the motto that we have in Northampton 
Uh, the mayor presides over the school committee meeting um, and also votes in the school committee. Uh, in addition, the mayor presides over the city council meetings but does not vote. And um, the characterization of this model is that uh, we have a strong executive power and we have weak legislative power. Um, our group has gone over every kind of uh, alternative that we could have to this system. And so uh, the first one, which uh, could apply to both uh, this, the school committee and the city council, is that uh, the mayor does not preside and does not vote. So um, I just want to say, um, you know, it's sort of self-explanatory there, but uh, the advantages are, are that uh, there would be an increase in legislative power, there would be a decrease in executive power, and there would be an increase in the separation of powers. Um, the disadvantage is that uh, historically, Northampton voters have favored a strong mayor. Um, and then um, <coughs> moving on, well, I just want to say, excuse me, on the city council, that in terms of comparing it across um, the state, according to uh, the consultant that's working with us, Stephen McGoldrick, uh, no other Massachusetts city but Taunton has the mayor preside over the city council. So in that area, Northampton is definitely an outlier. Um, Moving on to um, alternatives that would um, just uh, apply to the school committee. Uh, we could have that the mayor does not preside, um, but that the mayor does retain a vote. And then you'd have some increase in legislative power, um, but you would still have the executive branch, um, uh, uh, you'd still have the executive branch voting in a legislative committee. And I just want to say that um, that is what they have in Greenfield and East Hampton, uh, towns that are slightly smaller. Uh, there the mayor uh, does not chair, but does vote. And um, in fact, the, the, the model that we have is the model that um, Agawam and West Springfield have, which is uh, cities that are comparable in size. The mayor chairs and the mayor votes and also cities that are a little bit larger, Chicopee and Holyoke, again, the mayor does chair and the mayor does vote. In clarification, that's yeah. just for the school committee. Just for the school that. committee, yeah, moving, yeah, down in the school committee. If I could just add one quick thing. Yeah. Could everybody check the papers in their hand? Somebody walked away with the sign-in sheet. <laughs> Anybody want to check the papers? <laughs> I'm not going to really wing it this unless you see it. No, you have it. You got it? Yeah. <laughs> Is that Steve Harrell? Free ice cream for everybody. <laughs> 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 okay, let's go ahead and finish up, Maddie. So, uh, so then the, the final alternative. Time out. Time out. Um, you alternative, which again only applies to the school committee, is that the mayor would preside um, over the meetings but would choose not to vote. And that would have the advantage of um, the mayor continuing to keep order of meetings, especially contentious meetings, but there is some decrease in executive power. And the disadvantage is that the mayor can, you know, would con uh, continue to lead uh, a major legislative committee. So I hope that that frames the discussion, and there are a lot of people on this list. I wanted to say that it's twice as many as wanted to speak on this previous issue. So if you could just tailor the length of your comments, keeping that in mind so that everybody can get up there. Bill Ames, please. Yeah, this was one of the two that I thought was one of the more important ones. I will mention that um, the compensation on the school committee and, and city council, they should be equal. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> and in electing the um, uh, city clerk, I'd say it should be an appointed position. That's all. I'm done. It's getting late. See, yeah. I, I've got to. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, whether the mayor presides, I would say he, he or she should not. 
Bill, you should I'm have sorry, this. Can you tell you whether you're talking about the city council or the school committee? Both. So we understand? Both. Okay. Yeah. Each one ought to operate with their own, either the uh, council president would preside, the mayor can come in when there's an important proposal that he wants to bring to the city council mm -hmm. and present that, but that would be it. He would speak only when he had an issue that was uh, one that he chose, or he or she chose to speak on. I think there should be a, a separation of powers there between the mayor, who is the executive, and the council, who is the legislative body. Thank you. Um, Gene Tacey, please. I'll be brief. I've been saying for 10 or a dozen years that uh, I never thought that the mayor should preside over city council or school committee. Um, it seems that debate often gets stifled, and the presiding officer uh, is the parliamentarian mm -hmm. and can interpret the rules in many different ways. Um, not according to what is actually written. And he's, well, uh, and in the school committee, you have a, you have a, you know, not to say that the mayor is not intelligent, but you have intelligent people that are, in some cases, they are educators, whereas the mayor may not be. And I've seen the school committee come up with some pretty good programs that were squashed instantly in a minute. Oh, there's no money for that. They don't even have a chance to debate it. It doesn't get vetted. It doesn't get aired. And the school committee gets squashed by the mayor. I've watched that for years and years. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councilor Labarge? I really feel that the mayor should not preside uh, at City Council. I like the idea, and I've attended the meetings in East Stanton, their City Council meetings, where they have a president and vice president. And I think that makes sense. Okay, I really feel now 14 years working with two mayors, Mary Ford and Mary Claire Higgins, that I could see that there definitely needed to be a change. Okay, the power is there, sitting where David Stevens is as our mayor. It's not good. I think that we should be our own body and the mayor should not be involved. And with our um, charter committee at that point, Mary Claire Higgins did agree, and she did not have a problem about a mayor being the chair of city council. For a school committee, she did agree that the mayor should be there because of the financial aspect of it. Do I agree with that? No. I have to agree that I think they should have a chair and a vice chair. Both at City Council and also at <coughs> School Committee. Do you think the mayor should have a vote at School Committee even if he or she doesn't preside? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, next is Wendy Foxman. Um, I'm a rule player, but I'm gonna, since all the rules are getting bent, I'm going to just say a little thing about the context in which all my remarks are, which are having worked in so many other communities. I, I'm really looking outside and looking at sort of marketplace and external equity in terms of compensation, everything that I've spoken to. So yes, it isn't fair, but it's not fair everywhere. So um, I, on this issue, I, I think there's general consensus that I've sensed and everyone I've ever spoken with that the mayor should not be presiding over the council meetings. Uh, the city council president should. I, I was, if we were going to get to this topic, speak to, I think there should be a, a um, vice chair, or vice president of the council, um, but when we get to that next issue, what to do with the mayor's absence, like that issue would come up. Um, I think the mayor should also not chair the school committee, but definitely vote. Thank you. Um, Jesus? <coughs> I'm going to say virtually the same thing that everybody else said before me. I think there's pretty good agreement that, well, I'll, I'll just say what I, I don't think that uh, the school committee should be chaired by the mayor. I don't think that the city council should be chaired by the mayor. I don't think that the mayor should have a vote in the school committee meeting. Um, I think, and again, I just want to 
say the same comment that I said before about compensation. If we have that change in the school committee, then you should probably, the president of the school committee should probably get more compensation because they'll have to do more in presenting the budget and um, all of those other things. Thank you. Alex Giesler. Hi, Alex Giesler, 164 Riverside Drive. <coughs> I believe that I'm on the same side as Gene Tacey, Bill Ames, almost wow. everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and they, for the, it's the city council, which is the body that I have most experience with, I represented Ward 5 for eight years. Um, and I thought always in that time that it's not a question of power. The uh, city council has all the power it needs. What it doesn't have is a culture and a mechanism for exercising that. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't foster a culture of its own. City Council needs to be a legislative branch, and it needs to run those meetings. It needs to be responsible uh, for setting those agenda, and it needs to be held responsible for pushing the conversation of the city forward. It shouldn't The Council has a tendency to let somebody else uh, take, uh, take responsibility if it'll do it. And the mayor, uh, a, a very... Uh, a robust mayor like uh, Claire Higgins takes uh, all uh, of that that uh, is left open. And I, I just uh, I, I felt very much that the lack of leadership and, uh, on the council uh, was uh, really inhibited the public conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Mary Casper, please. Uh, Mary Casper, one of the High Streets, Lawrence. Um, I'm going to just reiterate what everybody else has said. I don't think the mayor should chair city council meetings. I don't think the mayor should chair school committee meetings. I think um, the vote for the school committee, I think, is important for the mayor because of the financial implications of the school budget, and I think the mayor really needs to have a vote there. But in terms of chairing the meetings, I don't think so, and I think there should be a city council president and a vice president, same with the school committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mimi Augers? We just keep tag-teaming each other. <laughs> um, I'm going to just reiterate what everyone else says. I don't think that the mayor should chair the city council um, or the school committee. Most of the city council, I, I mean, I, we're, we're a democracy. You know, we, the president doesn't chair Congress. You know, we separate these branches for a reason. Every child in grade school learns of the three branches of government. We have branches here. It's, uh, it's difficult because we, a lot of us are going to go back. As, the judge has looked beyond it, but we, can't, we look back and, then, and we see that we had a very strong mayor in, in Claire Higgins who chaired the city councils and, and really her power was wielded through there, and, and we saw that. Um, and I think that... But, beyond, but looking beyond it, it's so important that we really do try to build up our legislative branch. Um, true forms of democracy is that we would have a strong executive and a strong legislative, and they would work together to make our city stronger. So um, as for the school committee, I think the mayor should be there. Should be, I, I think the mayor should probably get a vote. I mean, the mayor will have important information to provide to the school committee. But just for everything, they, the, the mayor shouldn't be chairing it. So thank you. Thank you. Steve Harrell. Hi, I'm going, uh, Steve Harrell, uh, 474 Elm Street. Uh, I just want to talk, address the uh, question of the uh, school committee here. Um, as I mentioned before, I've been to a large number of uh, school committee meetings over the last three or four years, and also even uh, subcommittee, school committee subcommittee meetings. Um, I, the chair, I don't think that the mayor should be uh, the chair of the school committee. <coughs> the chair, of course, can... Uh, guide the discussion sometimes in subtle ways. <coughs> they can hurry it along or allow for longer pauses at certain points if they want more people to address the issue that they uh, <coughs> would like to hear from a certain angle. Um, the chair can limit the public comment period at the beginning of the meeting at their discretion. That's in the school committee rules. Um, <coughs> they can ask for a motion or not ask for a motion to move something along or stall it. Uh, they can ask for a suspension of the rules. Um, so there's a number of ways in which the chair actually exercises a considerable amount of power in any body. So, um, and also, 
Uh, the mayor is one of only three persons on the school committee who sets the agenda for the school committee. And I found that sometimes it's very difficult uh, for citizens or parents or certain school committee members to even get an issue on the agenda. And the mayor participates in that seemingly in the background kind of decision, but that can be critical. So um, I do think that the mayor should vote. Uh, that sort of makes sense to tie the work of the school committee in with the rest of the city and so forth and keep that in perspective. But they should not be the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Harry Hirsch. He's gone. Steph Jacobs. <coughs> Deb Jacobs, 82 Grove Ave Leeds. I, um, I think having the um, city council run their own meetings is a, is a pretty exciting uh, way to go, and I, I hope that, that that's the direction you take it in. I'm, I'm, not, um, I, I'm not as familiar with the, the school board, but I think that the mayor um, should not um, preside. And I don't particularly think she should be voting either. Um, I think she needs to make her case. If you go to planning board meetings, the, um, the planning director or his staff are at all the meetings and they don't vote. Um, UPW has um, the city engineer and the head of the um, Department of Public Works there, but they're not voting members either. And I, I, I think that's... Um, if you have seven and two, that's nine people, so you've got an odd number. Um, you put the mayor on as a vote, and um, that's ten. So I, I think you should think about having uh, the mayor um, be at the uh, school board meetings, but not as a voting member. Thanks. Thank you. Alan Seawall. Thank you. Excuse me, the name Jeff Mazzo. Nobody ever gets it right, <laughs> including most of my students. Um, basically, I'm going to answer the first question. Should the mayor preside over the city school council, uh, city council? And bluntly, no. My observations mostly come from the Higgins administration, and I noticed that um, usually it would kind of go like this. She would say something, and the rest of the councilors, with the notable few exceptions, would go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. The bobblehead effect, as I like to call it. Um, so I think it would promote a better separation of powers, a better system of checks and balances, which from my observation of this government, it desperately needs. And that's it. Short and simple. Thank, Thank you. you. Also, Jackie and Miso. I'd like to pass. You're going to pass. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> Now I know why the first committee didn't invite me for any uh, input, even though I got invited to South Hadley and to the town of Amherst when they did their charter revision processes, um, the, which, by the way, are the clunky old way where you started with 20 people elected by the community and with a mandate to study the charter long before anything else happened. It's very clunky, but it does get a lot of this stuff out early. So, very quickly, um, I would say, in my experience, uh, and that's four years on the council with a very strong mayor, Dave Musanti, um, not having uh, attended uh, virtually any meetings in the last 11 years, and my term, uh, four terms as mayor, went from 92 through the end of 99. Um, in my experience, uh, let me give you an example, in school committee, the mayor had nothing to do with the agenda. The superintendent sets the agenda of school committees. That's virtually universal. When you go to statewide meetings, it's one of the things you talk about, because every once in a while some school committee members want that right, but it's, it's not considered appropriate. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, my service on the school committee, Sometimes I resented the amount of time it took. It did not add a penny to my salary, which started out at $40,000 and ended up at $53,000 uh, 12 years ago. Um, but it was probably the single most important reason why I could 
understand all the dynamics of change coming from the state and school policies and programming, as well as paying a lot of attention to citizen and parent and teacher input, given who spoke at those meetings. Um, if I hadn't been there, I would not have been as knowledgeable in uh, ability to support their budgetary needs and to advocate for school funding on a statewide level, which was one of the things that brought me into elected office, uh, working on other people's campaigns uh, many years uh, earlier. So to me, there was a positive effect for the city of me being in that room. Well, whether or not I needed to chair, um, I, I don't feel as strongly about that. But I never felt that I had the ability to railroad anything through a school committee. If, if that would ever be true uh, of any full-time person, it would tend to be a school superintendent. School superintendents, like mayors, have different personalities and different ways of working with people. And, and I want to just, sorry, this is uh, uh, maybe a little privilege of a retired mayor, suggest to you folks on this committee and to everyone else in the community, do not mistake a strong mayor by personality and voluntary actions for a statutorily strong mayor. Northampton's charter was considered when I took office in 1992 to be one of the weak mayor examples around the state. And you might say, why? Because there were only two people the mayor appointed one secretary and the veterans agent, okay? There are 20 department heads. By the time I became mayor, the department heads had formed a union. I don't know whether you all know that. If, if you're going to look at simply the charter, old versus new, you need to also look at all the changes that have been made in the ordinances. For instance, the ordinance book now has a process for setting salaries of the mayor and, and uh, the, uh, the city council and the school committee. So um, you're not just changing the, the charter, you have to do a lot of squaring away. Um, and the, the relationship, I'm married to a political scientist. I understand it's illogical to have the executive in the room with the leg legislative body. But I would say this, when the executive branch is so squeezed in terms of management capability, as it has been in most of our cities, and certainly in Northampton, because with two out of three years in the last 30 years being budget-cutting, squeezing times through three different strong mayors, all of us have minimized how much help we had in the executive uh, office to help us administer the city. The mayor, by default, today, and I don't think this was uh, thought of in uh, 1888 or whenever this was first written up, has to be not only a CEO but a COO. There is no management <coughs> system that integrates all the departments except what mayors by their own interests bring. So Claire was able to, for instance, get the treasurer's position changed from elected to appointed, figured out a system, I think, with helping people in the, the city council <coughs> to do that without having a full charter review. I had been told by a city attorney 20 years ago that you had to do the full review before you tackled yeah. that particular position. And in my view, it was mandatory, not because we had a bad treasurer whatsoever, but it was really left us vulnerable not to have somebody with a professional financial management skills. So Claire improved that, and I know something was done, I think, in the ordinance book that gave her a little more direct relationship to the Board of Public Works. Yeah. But are you considering this in what you're reviewing? Most of the other mayors in the state would laugh at me when I would say uh, the Board of Public Works offered a salary to a fellow they hired to be the executive of that department until they were informed by the personnel person downtown that they actually came under the rest of the city's personnel system. 
they thought themselves separate. That's because they're appointed for five years, outlasting, you know, any two of these current two-year terms that we have on the books. Um, and then the one other thing, again, I want to stress, this power, it's a great power to shape the way the citizens and the, and the um, full-time city government relate to each other, all those board appointments, a couple hundred of them. Um, 20 years ago, we started a screening committee to accept applications to those boards that was actually started at, at Michael Bardsley's behest when I was a new mayor. Um, the, every one of those appointments um, goes to the city council. In fact, the Board of Health is appointed by the city council with no input from the mayor. I sat on the council when a fire chief was appointed by the mayor after the city council said, we will not accept an appointment you might make using a out of town process for out, out of town interviewers to interview a fire chief candidates. We know who we want, it's local guy X, and you better bring us his name. And another mayor did that, brought that name forward, and that person became the fire chief. So this is what I mean when I want you to understand. It has not traditionally been a real strong mayor system. So mayors do what they can. They either try to get their friends on the council, or they find a way to rewrite a little ordinance here and there. But the councils can fight back. And Alex was absolutely right on this. Bill Ames will particularly member, remember, and Wendy, when I became a new mayor, all my progressive friends gathered together and said, we think the public should have a right to speak before the city council meetings. And then the next thing they said, much to my surprise, we think the city council president should appoint the council's committees. Up until that time, the mayor had appointed the council's committees. Now that was a real breach of the separation of powers, but it had worked in a lot of ways. So again, I, I, what I want you to think of is the relationship between department heads, the accountability systems in the administrative structure, as well as what the electoral processes do to shape how the city runs. And don't just assume that um, uh, legislative separation will create some kind of strength because it will balance mayors that have too much power. There's no question mayors need to be balanced. But um, it, it's not only the structure which is responsible. And in closing, I, I know I'm going too long, but I, I have a microphone. I'm sorry. Um, a friend who uh, recently entered the room, um, the face reminded me, there was a city council president in maybe my second term, third term, with whom I worked very well, and who sponsored a bill that came forward without my approval to have Northampton adopt the Quinn bill. Any of you know what the Quinn yeah. bill is? Yes. I did not approve of that, I, despite my many friends in the police department. It was an expensive bill at a time that we were actually facing layoffs. That was voted on positively by city council, unless I had decided to use a real unusual type of veto and probably end my political career right there. I had, I had to sign it. So again, when councilors want to use the powers that they have, they have had power under the existing chart. Just two points of clarification, Mary, while you're up there. Um, we did talk about in the slideshow the comprehensive versus incremental changes. And on the incremental slide, it does list all the different ways that we have gone forward with just a small change in the charter. Okay. Um, you can refer to that as the public is interested. And then the piece of the compensation that, that uh, um, Todd was talking about earlier, and unfortunately I know you had to step outside the room when he explained the reason we took that on is because our consultant said that this was a time to examine it and get public feedback on it okay. um, as potentially a way to increase uh, participation. Sure. 
Sure. And, have a and, and there's no question, just for, for fairness or because of, uh, of inflation, that it should be changed. All I thought was that rather than leaving it the way it had been on the books forever, right. the council shall bring forth a motion and vote. I thought one more hand um, before I recognize we're out of time. Pat Goggins. Yep. Hi. I'm Pat Goggins, 671 North Farms Road. I wanted to uh, just mention um, that I've served on this body uh, twice. Once as an elected member back in 1972 when I was 10 years old. And, uh, and uh, later in, uh, I believe in the 80s, when, when a similar committee was formed to discuss what needs to be changed in the charter and how that might uh, be brought up to more contemporary standards. So I appreciate the work that you're facing and, and what needs to be done to uh, bring this uh, uh, charter uh, up to those contemporary standards. Having said that, it's not an easy job. I, I want you to also understand from a historical standpoint that back in 1972, and I don't think Wendy was working in the city at that time, although she may have been when the first charter vote was taken, um, it was it was a very uh, after being elected and, and having uh, gone through the process of, of uh, analyzing and modifying and making recommendations for a charter change. And incidentally, I should mention that at that time, that's how charters were changed. They were elected bodies. You may have already heard this from your your consultant. We had to hire a consultant at the time, which in and of itself was a huge controversy. But uh, all that being said, the process has been tweaked over the years, as as David mentioned, so as to allow this to be changed incrementally as you, uh, as you go along. And I understand that uh, many of the issues that, that people feel most strongly about have been addressed, although not all of them, because this is also one that people have also always felt strongly about, and I urge you to give it a lot of thought. I would agree completely with Mary. I was her city council president that she was referring to while she was uh, uh, mayor for many years. And, uh, and uh, I, I would agree with her that uh, we should not misinterpret what we have as a strong mayor uh, charter. It is anything but. It was considered a bastard charter. That's how they referred to it back in 1972 because it was something that didn't represent anything that conformed with any of the either Form A, Form B, or Form C charters that you're all, I'm sure, aware of and studying as, as options for the city. Um, I urge you to look at all of that because what has emerged is, is I would agree, uh, a, a, an opportunity for a person in that position to exercise uh, their own uh, ideology and, the st and, and, and show the strength of their convictions in certain ways by ha having a certain amount of power uh, vested in, in this strange arrangement that we have that, uh, where, the, where the mayor presides over the city council meetings. Now, as city council president, I would have loved to have run the meetings because you know how long it takes Mary to answer a simple <laughs> question. I had to run those meetings. Bill will tell you, we've been in and out of there. <laughs> but the, and the fact of the matter is that what happens is that you, you, but you do need to have some order, and I would also urge you to be sure that as you, as you contemplate change, to think about the impact of uh, such a change, as, uh, on, uh, particularly on the council. My guess is, just a guess, my guess is that what you'd see uh, emerging from uh, is a wicked council president fight every single year, the consequences of, what, of which would be felt throughout the entire two-year term that all of those councils will be trying to serve together. And you'll see a lot of turnover in that, in that position as a result of issues coming up and positions needing to be taken. And I only suggest to you that, that the stability that we've been able to enjoy as a community, with Dave Mizani in for 12 years and Mary in for 8 years or 10 years or whatever it was, and Claire in for 12 years, has gone a long way toward making this community what it is. We've been able to avoid the pitfalls that come from the constant changes that take place which I think would be much more likely to occur were there to be a change in, in, uh, where the council president is running the council, uh, where the, where the council uh, uh, president runs the, runs the meetings. Now, there's other benefits to that, and they need to be weighed. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue to pop in here from time to time and, and give you the benefit of the different experiences that I've had. But I would say to you that there's a lot of things that aren't as simple as they look. And, you all, and, and, and when looking at them, you're not, you need not only look at the present or the immediate past as a gauge of what, what uh, you should or should not do. You should try to contemplate the consequence of those changes as you go forward. So, thanks. Thank you very much. You. I know that there are other people who might want to comment on this particular issue. I ask you to submit that in writing. Uh, check out the form out there where to send it. You send it basically to Mary. 
We want to move on to question five. Is there a sign-in sheet that can be brought up this way for me, Bill? Um, I'm going to run this particular session, and I ask uh, Maddie, do you want to keep track of time for us? I'm going to finish a little bit of time left over. We have a half hour. Um, this particular topic is very straightforward, very simple. Right now, there is only one other, other than the mayor and city council and the school, uh, school committee. We have a couple other people in terms of um, uh, smaller offices, but in terms of other major full-time employees, there's one left, it's the city clerk office. And it's very simple. Should the city clerk be elected or appointed? We made the transition, as we mentioned before, with incremental change to move the treasurer out when we create the CFO position. Uh, but now the question has been, should the city clerk be an appointed slot or an elected slot? And um, we talked about, there's a chart up there that talks about some of the things about avoiding patronage and strong qualifications, but I want to hear directly from the public on this. Gene, you're the first one on the list. I like the, I'm Gene Casey Ward 7. I like the uh, idea of the city clerk being elected. Um, I, I don't think that the mayor's office should be the boss of the clerk's office. I think the clerk should be allowed to, well, right now I think the clerk's office is probably the most transparent office there is in the city. Um, I can go down there and I can ask for any kind of information about the elections. Um, uh, I can even get opinions from the city clerk. And which, whether anybody likes it, I mean, and she's always forthcoming with information every time I ask. I've asked for some information out of the clerk's office that maybe the mayor's office might not want the clerk to just be passing out. And I like that. I can get anything I want from the clerk's office. Freedom of information, I don't have to wait 10 days. Um, and she's always been more than willing to answer questions. Um, and I think, she, and, and you can tell, uh, she's all, the highest vote-getter in the city. I mean, says a lot um, to me about how she conducts herself um, in that office. Um, but <coughs> she's been there for 30 years. I think the clerk before that was there for 30 years. And the one before that, they just, I mean, it, it's just, it just goes to show you that the people appreciate the transparency in the clerk's office, and they're always out to vote for all, all the time. I like it. I like. It. I'd rather have to say elected. And not only that, it's one little piece of power that comes out in, in the balance. So, thank you. Mary, can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Yeah. Um, what if it was appointed by the council and not the mayor? Would that mitigate the concern about concentration of executive power? No, because I said it before too. I think that there's not enough people that are struggling, and you don't get you don't get you don't get all of the representation from the entire city, and you do in an election. The entire city gets to come out and vote, so um, I, I don't. I, I don't think you get the balance. I just don't think you get it. Marianne, I'm here in full support of um, the city clerk being an elected position, and um, yes, Wendy has been with the city for thirty something years. I have to say. I've had many people, and I don't know if Barry's still here, he is here tonight, who have called me in regards of the best practices being used in that office. The transparency is there. It's a busy office. Some people might think, oh, they just do dog licensing and birth certificates. It's more than that. There are, I did a little survey, 243 elected city clerks in the state of Massachusetts. So I think that kind of like tells you something. I am, in the, yes. And I just think that in Wendy's position, she's extremely reputable in our city. She runs a very well department. And we need to look at how short of staff she was at one point. And she had that office still running. So I'm in favor of keeping that position elected and not appointed. And is it healthy to go appointed? 
I don't think the mayor should have any control of that. I think it has, and it has shown, that it is operating very, very well by being in an elected position. Thank you. Wendy. <laughs> I have an opinion. Yes, I do. Um, Wendy Mazza, city clerk. I live at 44 Evergreen Road in Leeds. Um, I'm going to give you the top 10 reasons uh, why the city clerk should be elected and be responsible to the citizens of, for their office. Um, the small town tradition of having a elected city clerk is one that I want to retain. It is a tradition that has stood the test of time because it works. Besides maintaining the small town heritage, the elected clerk has some pragmatic advantages over an appointed clerk. Although elected clerks are department heads, they are self-governing in their actions and are able to appoint their assistant city clerk of choice to assure the independence and integrity of both the office and the work involved. The city clerk knows what the staffing needs are and is best qualified to make such appointments. The assistant city clerk may be called upon in the absence of the city clerk to act as the city clerk would. In the role of registrar of voters, it is vital that the sanctity of the ballot is maintained. The office of the city clerk is a hybrid of city and state responsibilities and would function less efficiently if run directly by the mayor and or city council. Electing a city clerk avoids the cronyism or politics of having an appointment made by the mayor or council. Furthermore, we have a sensitive role in the administration of elections that would be ill-served by being beholden to those who are seeking re-election. An elected clerk is directly accountable to the people of the community and thus serves at the will of the people, not at the direction of the city council or mayor. This is especially important during elections when the independence of the clerk's office is vital. An appointed clerk comes with an inherent conflict of interest in this area. The decision of electing a clerk involves an electorate of several thousand people as opposed to an appointment made only by nine members of a city council or a mayor. Elected city clerks are more service oriented. They often are more accommodating to the people who have elected them, such as a panicked citizen who needs a copy of their birth certificate on a holiday weekend, which I have done. Appointed employees after six months on the job should only be removed with cause, requiring, poor, requiring proper personal management skills on the part of the council or mayor. An elected city clerk can be removed from office by the people at an election for any reason. Elected city and town clerks have employment longevity that affords them on-the-job training, when combined with information gained from uh, clerks' conferences, this is a formidable amount of knowledge regarding what is required by law. It would be untenable for the council or mayor to manage a department with insufficient knowledge of what the job entails. An additional layer of management has never resulted in increased, in, uh, increased efficiency ever. Elected city, elected city town clerks has served the cities and towns of the Commonwealth admirably for the many years, there is no valid reason to take this responsibility and right away from the people. The people's power should never ever be taken out, out of the hands of the many and placed in the hands of a few. Thank you. Wendy, one uh, specific question mm -hmm. related to this. Uh, we've talked about increasing terms. Mm -hmm. Is that something you want to venture into and mention? You run every two years. And that doesn't bother me. Every two years I would prefer that because then the people have a choice. They're, they're able to make a choice whether I'm still doing a good job in my office. It gives a, a, a person a, uh, the uh, ability to run against me, and I've never had a problem with that. We have had clerks come up through the ranks. Every city clerk that has been there since um, Mr. Faulkner has been an assistant and has worked in the office for many years and has the knowledge and responsibility in hand uh, for what the office requires. Um, and it's been a natural progression. Uh, I've been in the office for 39 years, um, and I've been city clerk since 2004. Um, so, I mean, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a view one way or the other, whether it's two years, four years, three years. I mean, you know, it really, at my point, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, 
whatever whatever this body chooses to do, but it does matter uh, if it's an elected position to me. Any other questions for the city clerk before she seats herself? Please. <laughs> Um, you brought up a couple of times the issue of integrity, independence, mm -hmm. yep. the sanctity of the ballot, and mm -hmm. the lack of conflict of interest it might be an issue. But is that, are you, is that the only thing that stands in the way, the election uh, of uh, any potential for fraud or lack of independence, lack of integrity? What about the other 124 cities that don't have uh, an well, they don't have elected um, city Well, I mean, yeah, they're, they're appointed by their town selectmen. Sure, but what I'm getting at is, aren't there other safeguards that would preclude a... Uh, potential for fraud or lack of independence or conflict of interest? Mm, I've heard from several city and town clerks, um, and I have their emails, and uh, one, there has been some mention that uh, there has been some push from some of the selectmen to do things um, during an election process that are not according to the law. And but aren't they, say, aren't they, do they do things that are contrary to the law? Uh, they some be of them do. Prosecution if they some do? of them do. I mean, and the clerk and, and the clerk as an appointment risks the fact of saying no and puts them in a position of uh, of being either fired or not being able to have a good performance evaluation. And that's where that lies is because you are being beholden to the the people that appoint you. What if it was a longer term? So it was a term that was five years or ten years, so when it be for more to um, a two-year term? Uh, I, I mean, even that. I mean, even that. I mean, I don't feel that a city clerk should have to answer to uh, the council or the mayor on the procedures of what they do in their office. I'm already mandated by state law. The secretary of the commonwealth, if I'm not doing my job, they're certainly going to notify the city and tell them that this person is not doing their job. You need to do something about it. I, I have enough people watching me in Boston without having to have another layer of people at this end trying to tell me something to do that I can't do. What I'm saying is, wouldn't those people in Boston still be watching you if you were appointed? Well, they probably would. They probably would. But, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of areas that, you know, I mean, one of the areas that, that, that you know, you brought up, um, I mean, with campaign finance, um, you know, whether, whether a candidate should... Uh, be with campaign, you know, have anything to do with campaign finance. It's the law. Whether I'm a candidate or whether I'm an appointment, it's the law. The city clerk has to handle campaign finance, plain and simple. There's, you know, there's no way around that. So, I mean, it's, I mean, they would be watching, yes, but I just think that you're adding another layer of pressure to a position that already has enough going on. I mean, I started off in an office of five people. I'm down to two. I'm down to two in my office. And I mean, there are constant demands and constant changes to that department. I mean, we've just gone with a whole brand new birthing program from the state, and now they're starting a whole new death program. That we, I, I just did a whole, whole um, online um, test today for it. So I mean, we're constantly changing. And it's not that the office is stagnated in any possible way. It's not. And I mean, I don't, I, for myself, I don't see the benefit of having an appointment. I really don't. Can I just say one more thing? Mm -hmm. Can you just clarify the roles of the city clerk's office in terms of policy issues that you deal with? Um, we, de we deal with uh, vital records. Those are the most important, the birth, death, and marriage. We have state laws that regulate what we can and cannot do with those records. Number one, we have fish and game laws. We're regulated by the, uh, by the Division of Fishery and Wildlife with those. We have, um, we also have um, naturally city ordinances for the city clerk's office. What we do as far as yearly licenses that the council has to approve. Um, we have gas storage that the council has to do. There's many things that we, we're, thank you. There's many things, I mean, I have a list. If you, I mean, this is the list of what this office does and what we're regulated by. So if it's not by state statute, it's by city ordinance that I'm required to do it. Especially the election process, the elections division regulates anything to do with, with the election process. Um, and you're the overseer. And I'm the overseer, the I'm the overseer of the elections. I'm also on the board of registrars as the city clerk. Um, and so, overseer of the open meeting law. The open meeting law, state ethics, um, all of that. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate you're welcome. your time. The next person I see is Jesus, followed by Mimi, followed by Deb. So three of our fast friends, and then we'll come back to some of the people who are in the audience. Jesus, quickly. 
All right, I'm just going to read off what I was going to say. Um, the city clerk should absolutely remain in an elected position. Political decisions the city had, in fact, on more than one occasion, rested solely in the elected position. I'm talking about petitions. Um, I would add, because this position is involved in the, elected, in the election process in general, that it serves as a necessary checks and balances. This meets one or more of the criteria included in the framework for considering ele elected and appointed off offices document presented to this committee. Maybe. I actually was having a conversation with someone on election day about the fact that we have a city clerk who is so capable and qualified, and we're very lucky for that. Um, but I worry because Wendy will only be able to do this job for so long. <laughs> and I say, what will happen when she's not there? Um, and how do you determine if someone's really qualified and everything? I, I wasn't, I just know that I vote for Wendy. I wasn't there when she got the job and how that, that process works. Um, the person I was speaking to also works in city government and said to me that the, re the same thing that was reiterated here, which is that when you go from being an elected to an appointed, there is a level where you might be asked to for, for whatever reason, it just becomes a difficult situation where someone either may ask you or you might feel pressured to do something that may not be the right thing. Um, so that's why I think it should be elected. I would also just like to say that in my short experience of working with Wendy, I could go to her and ask her something, ask her how a process would work, ask her what, how I would need to do something to make something happen within city government. And at no time did she ever try to put me off. If anything, she helped me to understand what I needed to do as a private citizen. If for any reason she was appointed and had loyalties to an elected official, and she knew that whatever actions I was taking was to do something to maybe uh, go against what that other person's policy is, she may not have been as helpful. But because she's <coughs> working for the citizens, she was there every time. She asked any question. Um, and I know that you want me to rush, but I would just like to say that looking down the line, uh, and again, I, I know that there's push for, I, I'm just a democracy person, and I just really believe strongly in elections and letting the people decide, and I'm very grateful we have one. Jeff? Deb Jacobs, 82 Grove Avalade. I would like to see the city clerk's um, uh, job stay uh, elected. I think it's important um, that we as citizens understand that this is a, a really important office and that it's one that we need to pay attention to. Um, when I, um, a number of years ago, the Lead Civics Association used to have these um, candidates night and we would invite everyone and we would get together and decide what kind of questions we would ask and we, when we first started we'd go like, oh yeah, and the city clerk now, what does the city clerk do now? What, 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 what should we ask them to do? And I think that enough of us in the city don't know um, how important the office is, and I think that by keeping it an elected office, it really emphasizes the point that it is uh, an, an appointment, I mean, a, an office that, um, that, that really needs to be um, supported and, and looked into, and it needs to be independent. And I, I, I like being able to vote for it. Thanks. Bill Ames, I saw your hand. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, should the city clerk be elected or appointed? Now, I think we've got to keep in mind that we're talking about the job of city clerk. What I've heard here this evening is testimony to the wonderful job that <laughs> Wendy's been doing. And I can testify to that 100%. She is doing a magnificent job uh, as city clerk. She's elected. But when I think back, okay, should the, the city clerk be elected or appointed with no name attached to it, I feel that that job should be appointed. It's an election that is run um, for an office that most of us don't know what in the world they do. So that if we have a mayor who makes an appointment but it has to clear the city council, I think personally 
and I don't want this to reflect in any way on Wendy, I think it's best that the job itself of city clerk be appointed. And I, 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 I just, I, you know, it, it's hard to, to take this position knowing of the job that she has done. And this, I don't want this in any way to reflect on that. The job itself should be appointed. I saw Pat next and then over here. And we've got several other people, so we'll get to them. Um, again, Pat Goggins, uh, 671 North Farms Road. Just again, a quick historic perspective, and I, I offer it only because I think it, it needs to be considered in the context of what's being discussed relative to all of the positions uh, uh, that you're uh, going to be assessing. Um, in 1972, after uh, a year of preparing a, a, a charter change document, uh, the vote was a, it was a very slim margin, less than 10 votes that we lost by citywide. The, the, the issue that became this, the individual most significant issue in the charter with respect to controversy, generated the most controversy, centered around the city clerk's office. And it was a simple suggestion uh, that the city clerk uh, not necessarily be the person to take the uh, minutes at the city council and to rec record the votes actually taking the minutes is something that's only more recently evolved. The, uh, the city clerk at the time, like Wendy, was a very popular person, a guy by the name of Jim Faulkner, who knew everybody in town, and if you didn't know him, he was related to him. And many of us recognized that taking, making such a, uh, taking such a position with respect to the charter was going to uh, be a concern, because there was discussion even then, in 1972, um, about whether the clerk should be appointed or elected. I'm sure you can understand. That, didn't, that did not pass, thankfully, because we'd have gotten beat by an even larger margin, probably. But the fact of the matter is that he was able to um, bring forth enough support to tip the scales. This is not the single most important issue that you're going to have to concern yourselves with as you uh, go forward. I would suggest to you, however, that for some people, it will set a, 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 uh, uh, an image of what may be going on here that may be difficult even in, in the uh, updated contemporary thinking that we find ourselves in nowadays to, for people to accept. And it needs to be thought through. Um, and it is difficult to do that without considering the, the incumbent who all of us will agree does a wonderful job. Uh, but from a structural standpoint, I'm not exactly sure whether this falls into the same uh, need to change category that some of the other things uh, under our city charter do. And I would just suggest and with a historic perspective in mind to be cautious about that. Barry? <coughs> yeah, I, I didn't know what this position was until recently when I had the opportunity to ask some assistance from Wendy and uh, she was very helpful and I would say just in general if I were to live in any city for one month and deal with the city clerk without knowing whether they were appointed or elected, just by dealing with them for a few times, I would know whether they were appointed or elected because I think if they're appointed, as in any business, you're going you're gonna to find some resistance if you're working against the boss. And, and in this case here, it was clear that this person was elected and independent. And I don't think it's tied just to the individual. I think it's a reflection of what has been said in favor of keeping an elected position. Wendy Fox, would you have your hand up? I actually thought I'd signed up, but I had something on this. Um, in 30 years or so in local town government, I've watched these chain, all these positions go from elected to appointed, um, except with the, for the town clerk. And I really don't see a compelling reason why a town clerk needs to be appointed. I do see it for the fiscal officers, and I'm glad that change was made here in the city. Um, I also feel that the discussion around the individual and the, and the per, it should be separated from the position. Um, but I think it should remain elected. Um, I also, what was I going to say? Um, oh, if you decide otherwise, certainly should not uh, change that until the incumbent has le leaves the office. Um, I also want to just say something big that I wanted to say, um, it just out there for you to think about. Um, Amherst had a charter review a few years ago. They recommended 
having a manager and a mayor and a council. I didn't support that at that time. I completely think it's a wonderful idea. I am not interested in being the city manager, but I, I think we're getting to the point where it makes sense to have professional management at the top and then a political person at, from the council level be a mayor. That's something to think about. And the only last thing I want to say is that I hope you will all read the best practices committee report and recommendations. Not very long. Um, there are a number of policies and procedures, sample documents, and rec structural recommendations that could find their way into the charter, if not verbatim, um, at least as tangential recommendations, and at the very least should in possibly influence your thoughts and intentions as you, as you move forward through this work. I didn't want to wait till December 6th to say that. Mary Casper? This has nothing to do with Wendy, as everybody has said. It, it, I have two things. I wasn't going to speak to this issue, but I was uh, working for the city when we had the change in the treasurer, and it made a tremendous difference to go from an elected official to a, an appointed official. And as somebody who worked with the treasurer, it made a real difference in all of our lives seeing that change. And I guess my, my question here more is, We've had two city clerks, I've lived here since 1977, I think we've had two city clerks in that time. And we talk about the election. I'm just curious, historically, how many of these elections have ever been contested for city clerk? For treasurer, they certainly weren't. So I'm just curious in terms of, of historic times, um, how long people have stayed in this position as an elected person. It's just a question. Thank you. The last opening when Christine resigned, there was a very competitive race. Mm -hmm. It pitted uh, the former voter registrar against the assistant city clerk. And that was a race that was very competitive and I think aired a lot of what the city council or what the city clerk does to make sure that the public was aware of the, the parameters and the far reaching of how important this job is to the city. Um, any other people, sir? Chris Powers, uh, Ward 5, uh, in reference to the clerk being elected or appointed, I'm going to have to agree with Mr. Ames on one point. Most people don't know what the clerk's office does, uh, so I find it a little hard to believe that if the city council, and Mr. Ames is the ex-city council, if I'm not mistaken, yep. would be involved in the appointing process, if he doesn't know what's going on there, the mayor and the city council should, should, certainly shouldn't be appointing that person in that position. <laughs> Going to the point of the, the electorate, which I've been involved with Ms. Mazza for almost 13 years as a campaign worker here in the city of Northampton, uh, a friend of mine sent me an interesting little report from the Department of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin in conjunction with Boulder, Colorado University, their, their Department of Poli Sci, in regards to elected officials versus appointed officials. Elected officials more often are, are responsible to the electorate and their municipalities are associated with a higher voter turnout. <coughs> municipalities with appointed officials more often are somewhat the appointed officials are beholding to their senior bosses and have a lower, higher purge rate in their, in their wards, in their towns. Elected officials are more responsive to the preference of the electorate than the appointed officials. Elected clerks are less likely to be concerned about administrative costs than appointed clerks somewhat relating back to keeping municipal fiscal affairs in order, and they generally value efficiency of the voter access when it comes to elections than an appointed official who is more concerned with running a fiscally conservative election. The local officials they appoint is but one office they must monitor. The cost of running elections take priority or considerations, and again, a cost containment of high turnout and maximizing voter access to the ballot is an elected official versus an appointed <coughs> official. So without question, I would say her running the uh, elections in the city, and I've worked with her almost 13 years. I can say Ms. Mazza has been exemplary in her, her demeanor, her, her doing the job. Uh, speaking from my vocation, uh, as a, almost 30 years as a funeral director, I worked probably with every city clerk in the Commonwealth, almost all 351. Uh, I worked in a big boiler maker in Boston, <coughs> and I've seen the difference between elected clerks and appointed clerks. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, I know I can find a city clerk when I need paperwork, and I have to have it to move somebody out of the country. Appointed officials, I can rattle off a few towns that I have to deal with on a regular basis around here, Amherst, Greenfield, uh, Westside. Uh, the appointed officials oftentimes serve at the whim of the elected official. She's elected, the mayor's elected, they appoint that person. I've seen a big turnover in the appointed officials, and I've had to sit down and, with these city clerks and hold their hands that are appointed and show them the process that we have to go through. There's no training, there's no classes at UMass for City Clerk 101. It's an on-the-job training class, trust me. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting there going through the whole process. I make a phone call to Wendy. It's a done deal. 
Uh, you know, Needham, Randolph, Tewksbury, I'm looking at towns in comparison and demographics, population, and uh, great towns to work with. Northampton, excellent town to work with. I've had to deal with Amherst in the last year. They had a quick turnover over there, and it's been a stumbling block, along with numerous funeral homes in the area. Uh, we've had uh, almost to the point of complaints filed with the state uh, and issues to that, that they don't understand what we do, and we try to explain them our process, <coughs> and they just buck the whole process all the way along. And I might add, uh, I'm with the funeral home in town that's not in the newspaper today. Uh, I'm with the Saluzniak family for many years, and they are very locally involved in politics. Uh, you know, the city clerk is the stopgap for numerous ordinances, codes, license, record keeping, enforcement, and a plethora of other hats that they wear in the city, including the rolling in of the registrar of voters in that office. Uh, again, she oversees a lot of elections. It, it's, it, the elected clerks really provide longevity and wisdom and knowledge in the job. The appointed clerks, there may be a short period of time they're in there, two, two years, maybe less, a lot less productivity. They don't know what's going on in the office, lack of knowledge. You know, to go through that process can hold up the whole city in many different facets, uh, business licenses, the dog licenses, everything, the taxi cabs, the, the bus passes. There's a whole different crew of things that passes through that office. You know, and, and, and second point, uh, or third point, I'll, I'll finish and summarize quickly. Um, you know, in terms of salary in the city, uh, the city clerk's office, I think the, the standard is around 75000 I believe Ms. Moss's uh, salary is around 62000 And, uh, you know, I, that's something I think that an elected position should be appointed. She's at the bottom half of the top 100 in the city. And when, you, when you've got a dog catcher that makes $110,000 in the city of Northampton, I have big problems with that. So I think that's something that should be reviewed. Thank you very much. Can I ask your follow-up question? Bye. Um, I mean, we're basing this on, on, on Windy when this will probably not apply to Windy. If there wasn't going to be a change, it would, it would be for the next person. Mm -hmm. um, we've been lucky that we've had city clerks that have had longevity at the ballot box. But there's nothing inherent that would be the case. If you could, it would seem more likely you would have turnover at the city clerk's office if it's at the whims of the ballot as opposed to an appointed position where that could be a five-year or ten-year fixed position. So if the, if the concern is having stability, why would it be an elected be inherently um, guaranteeing stability? What are you looking at for periods for appointment versus periods for election? I was thinking if the interest is that make sure it's a professional person who is going to have a institutional knowledge, something you can rely on. I understand you don't want someone who's going to be in every two years. That would be a, a tilt the world. I would think if that was the desire, if you had an appointed position with longer terms, you'd be more likely to have that kind of situation. Again, it goes to the wisdom of the longevity of on-the-job training. So you bring somebody in who's new, and they go through that appointment process, and so you give them a five-year term. I, I can agree with that point, and I can also agree with the point that I think you can't get up to speed in this office in, in six months or a year. I mean, I've seen clerks that have been in positions in two or three years by appointments in the, in the, in the Commonwealth here, and I'm just, you know, dazzled by the lack of some things they don't know. And, they, and you know, I know the phone rings up here. I, am I plugging a little bit for one day? Absolutely. Am I plugging for an appointed versus an elected? I'm plugging for the elected official. But the elected official is coming from, more often than not, Maza, Skorupski, Faulkner, Foley, going all the way back. People who have been in this office have worked have been tried and tested in the city to go out and take an appointment and hand that to the city council that is an elected body and the mayor that's an elected body. I, I don't see the wisdom in that in terms of that you know, they might be hope you're worried about one of the points up there is that you know avoid patronage. Uh, <laughs> one, <coughs> the, one of the clerks here raised uh, the city councilors raised how much twenty thousand dollars is there is there going to be a patronage there does he, is he beholden anybody and maybe wants to have somebody go in that position and be appointed. Are there other people who would like to speak to this issue? I'm watching the clock tick away. Seeing no hands before people exit. There are a lot of people who reference documents. Uh, make sure they get submitted. If you have further thoughts, we would like that testimony submitted. It goes to Mary Madura. There are sheets back there which tell you her email address. Please take them and circulate them. Please make people aware that this video exists and that we have been working on the questions. Could you turn to the last page, which has the, the December 13th, whatever it is? So next to the last page. Uh, December 6th, as you see on your agenda there, we'll be talking about the powers of the executive branch. Why is that relevant when we have a need for an acting mayor? That piece will come in there, temporary absence of the mayor. We're going to talk about the organization of financial procedures. 
We're going to be talking about uh, elections, citizen relief mechanisms, including free petition, initiative, petition, referendum, and recall. And we will put aside an hour for other. So I suggest you go home, you read the charter, you see what's supposed to be in the charter. If you have other ideas, other initiatives, other concerns, other things that should be in here, uh, please come and, and schedule for December 6th. The change in time is 6 to 9, and it'll be in this room. Again, we want all the uh, testimony to be submitted. We appreciate it. Thank you for participating today. It was nice to hear from the 50 or 60 people who participated in this. I hope that we hear from the other 28,000 uh, with their opinions as well. Thank you to my committee for taking the leads on each of these issues. We will see you in the near future. Thank you.